Hey everybody, my name is Nicholas Rogers with the Big Timber Lodge, and this is the All Are Welcome podcast, and I'm very excited to have a special guest on today, Chuck with Alaskan Ballistics. Chuck, I I would kind of do an introduction for you, but you kind of tell your story so well, and I do have a lot of questions for you, but just go ahead and introduce yourself to my viewers and listeners that might not be familiar with your channel. All right. Well, my name is uh, Chuck. I uh, run the Alaskan Ballistics YouTube channel, and uh, I'm a numbers nerd, so I shoot everything I can over a chronograph. Any combination of gun and ammo I can, I get it. I shoot it over a chronograph. I do some gun reviews and some hunting and all that kind of stuff, too, um, but I shoot everything I can over a chronograph. I'll shoot into some port shoulders for a more, real, more realistic meat test than just ballistics gel, and uh, that's uh, generally what I do, a lot of redneck science, and I got into it because I started having a lot of pain that prevented me from uh, hunting as much as I wanted to. And uh, I was like, well, I got to have a way to justify all these guns. So, you know, <laughs> that is what it is. So, you know, that, that's, that's what that's what happened. Right. Uh, are you married? <laughs> yeah, I'm married. Uh, we got two kids. Uh, OK. <laughs> interesting. I, I, I'm from Georgia originally. I moved to Alaska after my divorce. So I said, screw it. I'm moving to Alaska. Best decision I ever made. So, really? Yeah. So they say your problems follow, follow you wherever right. you go. That's what they say. But my problem stayed in Mississippi. So that's, that's cool. she's still down there. So, <laughs> yeah, I pray for her new husband every day. So oh. anyway, <laughs> sorry. No, <laughs> he, I got I, and I, I, cur- I encourage you to do. He's going to need it. So anyway. get the pressure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> so. I'm not above making divorce jokes 10 years later, so. Oh, man. No, I feel you. I feel you. Are your kids from that marriage or from your current marriage? They're from my current marriage. Uh, All right. I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old. Right. uh, And I'm 42, so. Yeah. 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 Most of of my former students as a teacher, I'm a school teacher by trade. Most of my former students, a lot of them have kids older than my kids, so. (laughs) Wow. So, makes me feel old. No, I I feel you. I turn 42 in about a month and a half and um i have a one and a half year old and a four month old oh wow <laughs> so we're kind of yeah, we're, we're, the we're, the, we're the same boat brother <laughs> yeah, we are in the same boat yeah i like yeah. it yeah i like it dude well yeah i mean i love watching your channel just because you bring a different flavor and it's interesting too because your personality isn't necessarily what i seem to th- to see in YouTube as a typical ballistic nerd personality because you're more outspoken. You like to do stuff other than just shoot guns. I watch bullets for bucks as well. And it seems like you guys have a lot of fishing videos out in the the Alaskan rivers and there's grizzlies around. You're a teacher. You have a lot of cool hobbies that you're involved in and not just shooting. I mean, I love shooting as well. Um, What kind of got you into shooting originally? Was it something you were into as a kid? Yeah. yeah, Okay. My my dad got me into shooting 22s as a kid, that kind of thing. Getting me into YouTube uh, during that divorce process, I was, um, I was uh, selling cars at Toyota in Georgia and uh, we had to make YouTube videos of each car and send a link to the customer. And so that got me into doing actual YouTube. And when I started, I started out up here. Um, I started out by uh, my music writing. I write classical music of all things. Like I'm like, I'm like, that's how diverse I am. I, like I'm a ballistic nerd. You know, I played football and I write classical music. So I was posting some of my symphonies and string quartets and stuff like that. And so, you know, stuff like that. So, um, that kind of got me into YouTube, but I've been shooting guns like, you know, since I was, I think I was eight when I first shot my 22, eight years old. Uh, I was five years old at my granddad's farm in Tennessee when my dad let me pull the trigger on the shot, 12 gauge shotgun while he held it on a crow's nest, crow's nest. So <laughs> did you uh, hit it? Uh, yeah. I mean, he was aiming. I was the one pulling the trigger. Oh, okay. okay. So he, he was, he had it shouldered <laughs> and. I, I was allowed to pull the trigger. He aimed at a, a thing. He still had, like, he marked it with masking tape, Ch- Charles's first uh, shotgun shell or something like that. That's so cool. So, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, that's that's cool. It's, it's funny that you mentioned the music because, like, this is my office. I do a lot of work from home. I also work on military bases. I'm a defense contractor. Do right. my a lot of my YouTube stuff in here as well. All of my YouTube videos, though, I'm currently still filming, editing, and uploading from a cell phone. So um, I don't edit from a cell phone, but I film mostly on a cell phone. Now, what, what, how how are you editing your 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 videos then? Um, I have software, uh, iMovie, 
you know, iMovie okay. is really good. Um, but I have some other software on my on my Windows computer. Okay, uh, so what do you do? You just plug your phone into the computer and then download the videos, transfer and then the files, and then cut transfer them, the yeah. files. Yeah, it's a lot easier than doing it on the phone for for me. Might be I, it, but yeah, for everybody. I, I bet it would be a lot, dude. It's so I use I use a program called Power Director, and I and I pay to use it every year it, but it's it's tough man i get so frustrated dealing with like that little screen and i got big fat little figures on there and my, just yeah. it's tough <laughs> it's tough um i'm so movie, man yeah I'm I, I need to check something out uh check that out that that would make my life a lot simpler but all right back to what you said so you were growing up dad your grandfather got you into shooting um that's awesome that's kind of the same thing with me my grandfather took me out when i was five years old said hey hey this is a 410 shotgun i remember he brought out two pie tens and then put one up against the fence that took the shotgun and shot it and i was standing right beside him i was like holy shit you know like it was so loud he goes this is not a toy because at my grandparents house they just had guns like against the wall on the on the cabinets on the counters uh, you know, and my grandfather wanted me to learn at five years old that these things could really hurt you. Then he, it was a single shot, you know, breech barrel shotgun. Uh -huh. And he said, he put the, another pie to now. He said, now you shoot it. And then he helped, you know, he got behind me and had me shoot it. And I didn't want to touch a gun. And then the following summer, when I was at my grandparents house, they called it the great babysitter where my grandfather didn't want to have to deal with me when I was six years old. He wanted to go work on the farm. So he took a lawn chair out. It, it put a single shot of, of 410 into that shotgun and sat me down in the lawn chair. It said, anytime you see a blue jay fly to that tree, shoot it. And I sat there for hours waiting for a darn blue jay to come by. And they're in Texas, but they're just a very scarce bird to see in Texas. So it was like the great babysitter. It was, it was a way to keep me preoccupied. And then I got my first shotgun from my dad when I was 10 years old myself. So it's really kind of a similar story. Now, the the music stuff, I'm interested in that because, like, I've got three guitars over here. I've got two acoustics, an electric, and then I've got my piano back there. And I write music myself. So I know I just turned around from the mic. That was a dumb move. But I'm interested to learn about your musical journey. You said you wrote classical. How did you get into that? That doesn't so seem I, like something. I did viola in middle school and high school and uh, taught myself to play guitar and piano um, and bass guitar. And so I... Um, played viola of course i can if you play viola you can pick up a violin if you're any good and play that too so i play five instruments and uh i just i would taught myself how to make chords and how to kind of do the theory and stuff behind it and i i'm not a great player of music I'm like i can sit down and play a song i could play in church bands and stuff like that but i'm not a great player of music or even singer but i'm a great behind the theory of it and mixing things together so i I have a computer program. My my mom bought it for me when I was 16, and I've upgraded it since. It's a Finale uh, music writing program, and I, I literally I type things into a music score, and it plays it back for me. And you can get so many playback sounds now that are, I mean, they're not 100% real, but they're they sound good compared to like they used to sound like an 80s Casio keyboard, right? And now they actually sound pretty decent. Uh, I use the East West sounds, um, Hollywood Orchestra sounds. And uh, they're pretty good. They even have some really good guitars now. So I've done things like arrange Pachelbel's Canon for in D for electric guitar and stuff like that. Um, and it's all on like so it's under my last name, which is Bost B O S T Bost Custom Music Writing on YouTube. Uh, but yeah, uh, I do that, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I, I do that channel for fun. I've had that channel longer, and it's only got 500 subscribers, 542. Mm. Um, it suffers a lot from YouTube taking away subscribers. Like, really? That, yeah, it doesn't like that happens to everybody. It's not just gun tubers. Like gun tubers right. complain. Gun right. tubers complain. Oh, they're demonetizing us. Oh, they're, it happens to everybody. Right. Um, and yeah. uh, and I complain those things too. So like, you no, know, they're demonetized. I don't have a short that I've published lately that they monetized. Or if I do publish it, if they do monetize it, it doesn't get any views. So right. like, it's like I'm on a some type of shadow band or something. I believe, but then again, like. I, there are other people that same thing happens to them and they're not gun content. Like, right. Uh, Ryan, I, I, Mc, Ryan Macbeth is a good example. Like he's getting demonetized all the time and mm -hmm. he's trying to talk about modern conflicts and disinformation and stuff like that. Right. You know? and, I, I um, did have a small YouTube victory though, the other day where I made a video and I got the yellow badge just off the, like I, I said, monetize the video. As soon as I said monetize, it instantly was yellow. So I requested a review and the review like came back like 48 hours later. Yep, 
We agree. So I made sure when I made that video that I didn't, I did not bust any community guidelines. So I actually reached out to the Google chat and they're like, what do you want us to do? I was like, I want an actual, whatever it's called a tribunal or <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what it's called, but where they, they re review it. And then I was like, I want an explanation as to why you guys mark this as confirmed limited monetization. I said, I, I made sure not to do anything. And then uh, less than like four hours later, I got an email back saying, you know what, we've, we've changed it to monetize. And I was like, hell yeah, this is awesome. And now that video has like 150 views. That's it. So yeah. it, it was kind of a weird thing where they were like, all right, we'll monetize it for you, but nobody's going to watch it now. It flatlined as soon as it got monetized. So that's a right. weird thing. But you're right, though, too. I, especially like in the music world, I did a live stream earlier this week and i played some music from an artist that i am um, uh, a big fan of and i like pay for him to pay make music his so uh, his name is trevor something and he does like 80 synth wave and he made an album called archetypes which is essentially just covers of 80s music and it's fantastic and i was playing some of it and i even called i shouted him out and i had some company it's if they said they were sony put a copyright claim on the song saying it was their musician making the music. And I'm like, no, not really. I, I know I own the record. This is from this artist. It is a cover, you know, but it wasn't. So, yeah, yeah. If they own the person who did the original, the, the, right. co the cover is copyright violating. And that, that would be true. Yes. Actually. Oh, wow. So like, so the way the copyright laws work is, um, when I write something or you write something, the moment it hits the paper or the moment it hits the, the synthesizer or whatever is recorded, it is legally copyrighted. OK, and uh, that is the, the moment that it is. It's not uh, you have to be able to prove that you wrote it first. So you have to mm -hmm. go through the copyright process, but it is legally copyrighted. And you or your descendants have the copyrights for 75 years unless you sell them. All right. Um. And after 75 years, whoever owns it has the chance to re-up it for another 75 years. So, gotcha. for example, if you owned a popular song from uh, the 1940s, you would re-up it. You, you would have already had to re-up it, right? Um, and then it would not be in public domain until 150 years later. Oh, so, wow. That's why all of, uh, I, like, if you look at my string quartet Christmas stuff, it's all religious, older hymn type uh, Christmas songs. Um, because if I did something modern, you know, um, and I, now I will say on the religious side of things, if I do an arrangement, if you're just doing a arra arrangement on YouTube, like I've emailed the companies before and say, Hey, I'm doing this arrangement. I have it on YouTube. It is in a private video already. I haven't made it public because you have the copyrights and you know, can I, uh, can I use it? If you email like most religious people, they'll be like, yeah, go ahead. All right. I was like, I'm not making any money off of it. I'm not, you know, uh, doing anything like that. So like, so I'm thinking about doing like some, um, modern praise and worship, like how great is your God, our God, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff, uh, uh, in string quartet and that kind of thing. So I, mm -hmm. um, so I was gonna, uh, kind of do that. And, uh, um, so what, what do you say? What do you say that? Are you talking like Michael W. Smith? Are we talking Rich yeah. Mullins? <laughs> are we talking need to breathe? Who, who are we talking uh, about that you want to cover? Um, well, I would be, I don't know the specific artist uh, anymore in, in okay. music. I listen to Christian, like hard rock now. Like okay. I listen to like thousand foot crutch and a few others, um, pillar and, uh, some do you other. ever listen to reptar? Never heard of him. Oh, okay. Um, but like I would be, uh, doing uh seventh day slumber does this. They, they take all the modern Christian praise songs that are popular for both churches and on the radio. And they, um, they write, a. Um, they write them in hard rock. So, um, you know, uh, that's pretty cool. So I just, I just want to take them and write them in string quartet. Um, so I would be copying a lot of what seventh day slumber did, but they don't own the rights to the song. It's usually, okay. usually hill song from Australia, a few other places, Hosanna praise mm -hmm. and a few other places own the actual copyrights. You got to so, find them. So explain to me then, because I'm sure a lot of your YouTube viewers, we got 16 viewers right now. Wow. It's great to have everybody here. Thank you for participating, uh, especially because you're probably mostly here from Alaskan ballistics, but thank you. But you guys all probably remember the older YouTube craze about 10 years ago, where it was just like cover bands. 
you know, and it was all like cover music, cover music, cover music. But right. how, how were they covering modern music and still getting monetized and still getting advertisements out there? How was that working? Okay. So I, I'm, I bet YouTube kind mm-hmm. of stuff. Yeah, it's it's an interesting interesting genre because being on the like the original composition side, like I get it. Like I want if if I get five cents every time that's played that. Uh, you know, royalties, um, if that's what the contract is for the radio, I don't want somebody playing it who's not giving me five cents. Makes you know? sense. Um, mm-hmm. So that's a lot, a lot of times how the royalties work. Uh, the artist or the composer gets seven to 10 or 15 cents every time it's played. But oh, that's wow. every, every radio station, every TV commercial, every uh, MTV music video, which they probably don't even show anymore. Um, right. All of that is like five to 10 cents to the composer. All right. Mm-hmm. Plus to the company, plus to that. Uh, and so that's how royalties work. And so, yeah, you could get rich, but you had to make it had to be played a hundred thousand times a day across the country. Right. You know. Right. Um, so, you know, if it got played a hundred, you know, that's seven thousand bucks, you know, a day. Uh, so it, it's definitely interesting there. So that's how those work. And so you, when it was being played on YouTube, and YouTube wasn't playing it, paying any copyrights, I'm sure they got into deep, deep legal trouble right. for that. Do you so? See, so- I don't. I don't really see you using music though in your Alaska ballistic videos that much. Like throughout it. So everything that is musical on the channel, I wrote. Oh, okay. Uh, except for some of the shorts where I do some of the trend music, um, whatever's trendy at the time, and that'll get you an automatic yellow too, by the way. And so, but yeah, uh, the uh, the sh- except for some of the shorts, almost everything I I have the the intro music, the outro music is all written by me. Um, and uh, any music in between, like I'll, I'll often have music underneath that slide where I compare the ballistics of stuff. Um, all of that is written by me. So wow, I might have to have you write write me an intro song. <laughs> yeah, those are the toughest because it's hard to write a five second song. Yeah, you can't develop any theme, and you know it's just like got a boom boom and it's done. You know, so those are hardest. Like you know, I, I try to write twelve to sixteen seconds, and that. That is difficult enough, but right. yeah. All right, but, uh, Hunter Kirk and Vogginson Outdoors. Uh, yes, I do hunt. I, I know Alaska ballistics hunts, right? Yep, I got a pretty good sized moose this year. Oh, really? Yeah. Bull or what are we talking? Yeah, uh, it was a bull. He was uh, 44 inches. I only published a short on it because I was going through a lot of stuff and I wasn't going to edit the whole video at the time. Mm. Um, just had a lot of a lot of stuff going on. Uh, between work and family and health and stuff like that. So, um, but I uh, published a short, and uh, you can t- see me take a really horrible first shot in the short, and then I didn't move the camera for my second shot because he's he's he took about ten steps and stopped, and I had a perfect high shoulder shot in the second mm-hmm. shot, just dropped him. I was using the caliber; it was a little too small, and I said I was just going to hunt with it till I killed something right. with it, and um, so I was using my six point five by two eighty four Norma. Wow! And so it's not not a very popular caliber. Um, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, uh, it was uh, one, you know, it's just a, it's in between 6.5 Creedmoor and 6.5 PRC. And so I took that shot and got a pretty good moose this year. So 127 grain Barnes LRX. So I've, huh. yeah, nice. uh, Barnes LRX is generally what I try to hunt with anytime I can. That is a really run- good penetration, right? Has really good penetration. It still expands. It a lot, often if it's going fast enough, it will lose its pedals or oh, its really? bone its bones but when it does that the core of the bullet still penetrates straight through so you get that energy transfer when it uh sheds its petals and they go into different places and cause different things to happen but you get that blood pressure drop of a bullet going all the way through a lot of people think a lot of people this is not a popular opinion these days a lot of people want uh, something that's going to go into the animal and explode right um that's what they think oh the animal will absorb all the energy well um they uh, uh, they've done studies on this type of thing. I'll have to find them, but the you'll get more recovered deer with bullets that expand, and they do expand and they mushroom and that kind of thing. They peel back the petals or whatever, but they go all the way through. You you'll, you'll mm. get more recovered animals that way, and the reason the reason is simply because the blood pressure drops a lot faster from two holes than one hole that can get right. covered up by fat or get. You know, uh, yeah, they're going to die. They're, they're heart shredded. They're going to die. But, um, you know, two holes is a, a lot better than one. So, yeah, I had that conversation with Logan from Ninja and Flannel 
because he shot his first deer with the bow and arrow with the recurve, wooden uh-huh. arrow, shot the deer. It wasn't as great of a shot placement as he would have liked. Um, and when he shot it, the, the deer jumped up in the air, turned and ran through a set of trees. And after hitting three trees, sheared both sides of the arrow off of the body. And right. it took him and it took him over 24 hours to actually track and find the animal. And by the time that he ended up finding it, that the animal's wounds were almost completely clotted up, you know. And so I think uh-huh. a lot of people don't realize that if you have a little bitty, like I think of like a 22 250 with like a V Max bullet, you have a little bitty oh, puncture God. hole, and then it uh-huh. goes inside. It creates this giant balloon, but that little bitty puncture hole has time to clot up. It, but there's no exit wound. You, you, you could be in really tough tough shape to to track at that yeah. point. Mm-hmm. And um, and I've seen the opposite too, though. I've uh. Uh, I had a, um, my first black bear, my only black bear, a small one. Chuke told me to shoot it. it if that's big enough, shoot it. Uh, Chuke from Chuke's Outdoor Adventures. We were oh, hunting, awesome. Hunting together. And um, uh, it really wasn't big enough to shoot, but uh, I shot it anyway. And uh, I hit it five times. I fired seven shots. I, I hit it five times, four of them while it was moving off, because the first shot nailed it, it dropped it, it rolled down the hill. And then it got back off it, up and crawled on its front legs t- to cover. Because um, the first shot, my rifle was a little bit off. His kids had knocked my rifle over in camp. And uh, my rifle was a little bit off. And mm. I, don't use, I don't use those mounts or scope anymore uh, for good reason. And I hit it in the top of the spine. So I broke connectivity to its back legs. Only. Oh, wow. So I started, I had no idea. It was 319 yards. So I had no idea where it was hitting after that. And so I was just aiming for the head and the, the uh, shoulders. It was going left, right. When we field dressed it, I had five bullets through that, that bear. And wow. uh, when we field dressed it and not a single one of them expanded because it was a Barnes TSX, the one that's not tipped. Um, and I got no expansion through there. And uh, right. we had no blood trail either because they're fat. Um, they're, they're so fat that they, um, like kind of like me right now, they're fat, uh, just kind of just like, gets in the way and just kind of gets that clotted back up almost instantly. Wow. So I, I've said if I'm bear hunting from now on, I'm taking my 338, period. I don't care if it's a small black bear because I want that big hole. And I want, you know, I'm taking 338. Which, I'm taking, which, which 338, though? Um, I have a 338 Winchester Magnum. A um, oh, Win Mag, okay. I yeah. didn't know if you meant like a Lapua or, or oh, what. Oh, I wish. I wish I had a Lapua, but those are expensive <laughs> um, and heavy. All those mm-hmm. long barrels and stuff like that. You need a four wheeler just to carry the rifle in, right? You know, um, but no, they're um, it, I like that's what I'm gonna bear hunt with from now on. That's mm-hmm. uh, my 338. Unless this company comes through with a 10 millimeter carbine, I might do that over a bear stand bait station type thing, which I'm I gotta I gotta do my uh, test for and get my right. card and official stuff for. Um, but yeah, yeah, three thirty eight from now on. Well, let me let me let, let me let me ask you this because you've taken a lot of nice what I would consider not exotic game, but game that not your average hunter in let's say the East Coast or Colorado or, or the South has taken. Right. Um, out of all the game that you've taken, what is your favorite to eat, and which ones are you like? Ah, it's not really that good to eat. My favorite to eat is um, by far the moose. Yeah, moose me too. Bur- moose burgers are good. Uh, I have not taken an elk, but the elk I have had has also been really good. Um, mm-hmm. elk, elk hunting up here is a little strange. I'll tell you about that later. Uh, remind me to ask about that. But uh, but basically, I could come down there with you and hunt elk for cheaper than I could here. What? Um, most likely, yeah. Um, but but to answer your question, moose and caribou are great to eat. Black bear is okay to eat if you mix mm-hmm. it, uh, if you get it in the spring. Um, brown bear, uh, it's a little rough no matter when you get it, but it's, uh, it's really tough and chewy. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you get it in the spring and you mix it, you get a young one in the spring and you mix it with pork or turkey or something like that, um, ground pork or turkey, you'll do okay. So that's a, that's a, um, one you definitely want to, uh, to, you know, you, you, the reason why you go hunt brown bears because a single brown bear can kill 40 moose calves in a year. Wow. Okay. So, uh, like, um, they've done college studies, and that's how many, 20 to 40 is how much they take. And I had a friend who's, oh, I'm not going to kill something I don't eat. When I told him that, he's like, he's like, heck, yeah, shoot it, you know? Uh, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, that's that you bring up a good point, because I've had black bear from a couple of different states, 
Um, I've had moose as well. My favorite wild game was a cheddar moose brisket. Oh my god, that mm. thing was fantastic! Ooh, it, it, was, well, it was like it was a, it was a garlic cheddar moose brisket is what it was, and I had it Ooh. as a kid. It was fantastic. And then also from the same taxidermist that that used the same meat processor, he got me some um, springtime New Hampshire blueberry black bear that mm. you know that blue, that black bear had a lot of blueberries. And then he 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 mixed it up. It was like it was like a sixty percent bear, forty percent uh, pretty fatty ground beef. And then we made burgers out of it, and it was fantastic. Now with elk, if you get into that back strap and you get like the little elk rib medallions, oh man, I've had some of those that were like sautéed and and red wine, and they were just fantastic too. Now I'm yep. getting really hungry. I love I love good wild game, but I've also eaten like deer before. That's like oof, this is really rough. Uh, yep. I've had some bear before that was really rough. Uh, so, I've had wild pig that was horrible. It's all about how it's prepared, and mm-hmm. it, um, there's a there's a few things, especially with deer. If it's been running, like if it's been chased by dogs or whatever, mm-hmm. um, that deer is uh, 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 that deer is going to be awful tasting. Yeah. So there is that, and then if it's um, if it's been breathing hard or it's been on alert, uh, where you know, there's maybe there's a wolf or coyote, or it's, it knows there's that you're in the area. It's kind of on alert. Well, the adrenaline starts pumping through them, and they right, uh, right. they don't taste as good too. But it really is all in how it's prepared. So all of my wild game meat goes into this uh, amino coconut amino acids. Okay, it's like a soy sauce for those of us that are allergic to soy. But I'm telling you this right now: if you will put any wild game that you think might be questionable, um, if you'll put it in soy sauce. An orange Fanta soda, and you, you marinate it in that. The game is gone. The game is really, gone. yeah, it's gone. That did you crack the code, or where did you learn this? Um, somebody told me about the soy sauce and soda a long time ago, and uh, I'm telling you, um, like, so I have severe food allergies to gluten and dairy and soy and all this kind of stuff. So I do those coconut amino acids, the fake soy sauce, and it's just amino acids from mm. coconut from coconuts. I do that in like a sparkling water and it still takes the gamey taste out pretty good. Wow. It's not, it's not as good as the original. Um, so when you kill something that day and you cook it that day, you have to cook it well done. Cause it's going to have diseases, right? Right. Right. Okay? Right. Right. If you, if you freeze it for a few months and then cook it, it's, you don't have to cook, cook it well done. Um, so one day when I was uh, duck hunting before I found out I had all these, uh, I killed a nice wood duck and it was the only thing we got that day. So I took it back to the house, and um, me and a buddy, were the, we were just said, hey, let's fry it up. And so I marinated it for about 30, 45 minutes ahead of time um, in uh, soy sauce and orange fanta soda. I put it on a George Foreman grill mm. <laughs> of all the little Foreman closed grill things. Cooked it well done, and that thing was – of course, it's a wood duck. They're really good. Uh, that thing was like a medium rare mm-hmm. filet, filet mignon. It was good. Yeah. It was that mm. good. I love duck. I freaking love, I love pate. I love all duck too. Uh, so not to call out another content creator, but Steven Ranella, you, you ever watch meat eater? Uh, no, I don't. So, okay. Yeah. So, occasionally I've seen him, but yeah. Yeah. But he, he, he tends to eat stuff more on the rare side and he'll eat it on the rare side, like out in the field, he'll kill it, gut it, clean it. And then, you know, and then serve it up. And, and sometimes he likes to eat that, membrane in the back of a caribou's eye he says it tastes like bread dough so a lot of people would do that uh steven went from bullets for bucks did that for when we went caribou hunting he was like out there eating it same day yeah but he eats bear balls so like (laughs) and he he he, he eats bear testicles yes bear balls and he thinks it's normal Oh my God! Well, I mean, I live in Colorado, bro. We're the home of the Rocky Mountain oysters, you know. Yeah, so uh, like, <laughs> no, that is uh, that's what he calls them too, Rocky Mountain oysters. And I am never gonna eat that. I'm sorry. There's there's some things that are like, uh, you know, you just there's some lines you just don't cross. Right. You know? <laughs> I mean, I, I like Stephen. He's a good friend, and he's a good uh, good hunter, and he's got a great channel, and he's got great content. And he's worked hard, and he's really had some su- success on his channel. So, if right. you guys subscribe to Bullets for Bucks. Go subscribe to him. But um, yeah, uh, I'm not gonna go eat balls, testicles from a bear. Um, no, no, or any I, I, other any yeah. other animal. That, that's yeah, just, that's no. there's some lines you don't cross. <laughs> I would so. agree with you on that one. I don't. Yeah, 
I just I couldn't get over the no. 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 No, I'll I'll eat the heart. <laughs> I mean Oh yeah, the heart. Yeah. Yeah, the heart. The heart is uh, the heart is muscle. I mean, once yeah. you drain all the blood, there's out of it. You have to drain like forever. But yeah, yeah. All right. So you had some questions. Uh, like, I think we're off topic. But I'm sure. Yeah, I know we I got know. we got on the bear balls conversation, and now we're way off topic. So yeah. Um. All right. Well, let me do this. So one of the things I like to talk about with people is like, uh, uh shit hits the fan. Rifle build, right now. Mm-hmm. You live in Alaska, so your idea of an SHTF build is probably going to be different than somebody like myself that lives in Colorado Springs that has like a million people or or somebody that lives in Boston that has like multiple millions of people or Manhattan or somebody that lives yeah. out in Iowa, right? right. Um, so are you working on an ultimate SHTF build for yourself? And if so, what is it or what would you like to do? Well, every gun is a work in progress for me. Uh, and I guess can't pick it up on YouTube, um, but honestly, and I and I don't think I put this one behind. Yeah, I did. Um, but uh, my 308 Aero Precision, um, it's a great gun. I know people hate on Aero Precision, but it it works. It's probably my go-to if I have to SHTF bug out. I also have two AR 20 inches for myself, an 18 inch for my wife, and a 16 inch carbine for myself so she she gets one ar i get three that's that's how we roll around here um, and but uh but the, the reason why i would bug out with the 308 i can show the magazine and the ammo right just not absolutely yeah you just yeah. can't have a weapon on screen yeah so like the you know 150 grain full metal jacket you know is capable of taking down anything in alaska uh, and it's also very capable of penetrating car doors and engines, engine, mm. not the engine block itself, but it'll knock every, it's not going to get shredded, uh, by that radiator or the metal in front of the radiator, like a five, five, six build would, um, mm. you know, five, five, six, your t- tires and driver, that's all you got. Right. Um, but you know, I can, you know, if I have to do something else and shoot into an engine block or, um, you know, barrier penetration, they're behind a tree, you know, the 308 i can you know i can hit the tree several that hardwood tree several times and they're no longer in, in cut under cover right um so like 556 five, it's going to be a totally different story i so. feel like i feel like the 308 is becoming a forgotten cartridge and and you might not feel that way but i feel like you just don't see it as often at the gun stores at least down here in the continental 48 yeah and um like so, it used to be the the all the precision rifle cartridges, the short range, uh, short action precision rifle, and of course, six five Creedmoor has taken that over, and rightly so. Like I'm a I'm a Creedmoor fanboy, and I'll talk about that um, if you want me to. Uh, but like the three oh eight, so just uh, the three oh eight has a lot more interesting. Sorry, my I've got my foot on my table and my screen shaking. Um, the 308 has a lot more interesting ballistics that you can do with it because of the range of bullets. So I 308, I can load 110 grain all the way up to 220 grain. Um, yeah. You know, um, you know, and even a subsonic 250 grain load is, was out there for a while. I don't think people had much success with it, but like so 308, you can do a lot of things with. So for example, when I hunt with my 65 Creedmoor, and I love my 65 Creedmoor Bergara, it's great. It's the most accurate ri- rifle I own. Uh, really? It's consistently, okay. it's the most accurate rifle. I have one rifle that's even cheaper that's the most accurate rifle I own. That's my 6.5x284, which is a Savage 111. Um, that one will gets me quarter-inch groups, quarter to three point three inch groups center hole. Uh, but my, my Bergara has, like, it's more consistently accurate. Gotcha. I've got, I've got half-inch groups from eight or nine different loads, like – in that Bergara <laughs> there's like I could I could go to the gun store and pick out ELDX or Barnes LRX and I know where they hit and I know an ELDX sucks as a hunting bullet as we were talking about earlier exploding in there but uh, I could pick them out and it shoots half inch all day long I rapid fired 12 shots of ELDX and it was under an inch um so wow like, that's, that's crazy a, that's a great rifle uh, but uh but my 6.5 cream ward can kind of answer your question I when I uh, was when Biden was elected, I had uh, some money and I went into the local door, gun store and left without most of my money. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I put together an Aero Precision right there, 18 inch heavy barrel AR-10, right? Right. In, in 6.5 Creedmoor. And so after ballistics testing it, though, it's 18 inches and 6.5 Creedmoor, anything below 30 caliber is semi overboard. You know what I mean by overboard? So there's not a there's. 
there's not enough room at the neck and in the width of the barrel to burn all the powder. So you have, right. to, have, you have to have length. Okay. Yeah. So anything under 30 caliber, in my opinion, has to have a, tw- a 22 inch barrel minimum for minimum. short action and a 26 inch barrel minimum for a longer magnum action. Right. So, um, and of course, you know, a 30 out six in between does okay with the 24 inch barrel. But, and so 6.5 Creedmoor, that 18 inch arrow I built, I'm losing. I, I shoot the 127 grain LRX from Barnes, the factory load. I've just got my hand loads perfected, and I'm going to work on those. Um, and so to answer your question, my SHTF build right now is ammunition. Like, I'm building ammunition. The guns are done, you know? Right. Uh, except for one. Uh, the guns are done. Uh, one and one's got to be tested. So I got two guns for SHTF that still have to go through to some testing. And right. Stuff. But that 6.5 Creedmoor gets a 127 grain LRX. It's... It's supposed to be going 2,800 on the box. That's a 22 to 24 inch barrel, 2815, I think. And I'm getting 20 on an 18 inch barrel. So I'm losing 200, 175 feet per second. Right. Now, what's what's the threshold, though, for that ammo as far as what's the needed velocity for you to get good ballistic performance? Um it, it needs to be 2,000 feet per second or above. Um, so if, if Barnes, that's the case, then yeah. you could probably, what, poke it out with an 18-inch barrel out to, what, 350 yards? Oh, easily. As far as the, the bullet expanding, yeah, yeah. easily. And that, but that's not, that's not the point I was going to go to. Um, my 308 is also an arrow precision 18-inch barrel. And I use a one – I have shot a 130 grain TTSX in it, so not the same bullet construction. The TTSX really needs that 22 to 2300 feet per second to expand really well. All right, it may expand, you know, down to 2000 or down to 1800, and that LRX might de- expand down to 1500 as they claim, but it's not going to give you that great expansion unless you're above 22, 2300. Um, same thing with Acubon, too. Right. I've noticed. Um, but anyway, the 308, that 130 grain. I can get it going. It's, you know, 127 grain for the 6.5 Creedmoor and 130 grain. You're talking 0.3 grain or three grains difference, right? Not not enough to be statistically significant. And that 308, I can get going 3150 in an 18-inch barrel. And I'm not near the wow. max lo- I'm not near the max load yet. Right. Like, like, I have not maxed out the powder charge, and it's going 3150 and going 3216 in my buddy's M1A. So, like, it's, like, that 6.5 Creedmoor's ballistic coefficient is never going to catch up to that speed that's a good point that's why i'm saying the 308 is probably the best uh shtf caliber if you live in a big game area right um, now how how would that do let's say if you uh ran into a a grizzly how would it i mean would a 308 take one down well people have done it with nine millimeters so a grizzly i'm sure somebody's taken a grizzly with the 22 with the perfect shot placement actually they have yes um there's a story uh if i remember the story correctly she was the bear was on top of her and she stuck the 22 in its mouth and fired a couple of times and it it fell over and she had she had crush injuries from the bear being on top of her but like she lived um if i remember the story correctly i have to find the link and send it to right her. um but the bear the closest closest route to the brainstem is actually through the mouth so she yeah. had the perfect shot placement but you wouldn't want it to be you know, an eyeball or something, or th- their nose bone right. extends out here. So. I, all right, but yeah. but this, but this, a one fifty grain full metal jacket. Yeah, it's going right through a bear's skull. Okay, um, they're not. They're they're a lot tougher animals when you shoot them through the body than a deer. Okay, okay. you know how tough deer can be. Right, right? they are exponentially tougher than like that. But they're not as tough as people think if you shoot them through the head. Well, well um, let me ask so, this then: What about a fall? bear fall brown bear that let's say fall kodiak bear that's been engorged on salmon you know and is weighing you know thousands plus pounds and really really fat how's your 308 gonna fare against something like that that's why you got 25 rounds (laughs) (laughs) man i I say capacity is king all the time for edc but that's for a different type of prey you know, uh, predator, a different type of predator, it's every, uh, different type of predator. There we go. Yeah. yeah a different type of predator. I like that. Now, yeah. what, what, do, I mean, with your, let's say bug out situation, if you are in Alaska and let's say something happens and a Russia announces, Hey, we're taking Alaska back from the United States and there's nothing <laughs> they could do about it. <laughs> That's what my uncle does too. Cause he lives at Kodiak and he was in yeah. the coast guard for 
25 years. He retired out of the Coast Guard at Kodiak, and he used to take those defense ships up and down the coast between the Bering Straits. Yeah, he does that as well. But, I mean, if, if you needed to, let's say, get out of Dodge, right, but you had to worry about people and then potentially animals, are you going to just bring one rifle or are you going to bring two rifles? Are you going to bring one to hunt with? Are you going to bring something suppressed? And then are you going to bring like a SHTF semi-automatic high capacity yeah. mag? What, what are you doing? Well, I've been working on paying medical bills. So I only have one suppressor right now. And oh, that, goes, uh, that goes in my 22 because it's a okay. 22 cam. Right. And that is going. That's in a pack. It's going. My bug out bag is an herbal stock pack. I'm going to be carrying my rifle and the 22 suppressed goes in the herbal stock along with, uh, you know, a bunch of ammo for it. Um, so, yeah, I would be carrying something suppressed. Uh, the other option is I might literally have um, my Smith & Wesson Victory pistol in a suppressed in a uh, um, holster that I have on the front hook of my herbal stock pack. Uh, that's how I hunt. I uh, hunt with a suppressed 22 all the time. Um, and I forgot it this year instead of bringing it. And had I brought it, I would have been chasing grouse instead of getting my moose. <laughs> um, so uh, something to think about is like you only do it when you can't see nothing and you're walking out. When you're when you're driving in on a four wheeler and you can't see um, um, can't see your game, you don't want to chase grouse then. Um, but all of that being said, like, yeah, um, the 308, it would be the 308 and the 22. Uh, my 10 millimeter tw model 20 would be with me as well as a backup, but I'd also, I'd probably be carrying four guns. I'd have the 22 in this, in the herbal stock. I have a model 20 Glock. Um, I have, um, uh, and there might be the 29 in the pack. I don't know. Um, I'd have my 44 Magnum on my chest. Um, and that, that's a big debate up here. 10 millimeter versus 44 Magnum. Do you want capacity or do you want power? And then right. the, answer, the answer is whatever you shoot better. I used to shoot the 10 millimeter better. I still do. But I've gotten to the point where I'm competent enough with a 44 Magnum uh, that I can, you know, I can go boom, boom, boom. As soon as it comes down for recoil and the front sight's back on the target, I can fire again. Right. Uh, I've gotten gotten to the point where I can do that, and I'm aiming at an eight inch or ten inch plate, uh, steel plate, and I'm, you know, 10, 15 yards away. I can just go bing. I've gotten to the point where I can do that, so I carry my 44 Magnum a lot more these days than I used to. Right. Uh, I used used to carry. Um, Back when I moved up here, I only had two 45s. That's all I had was a Glock 30 and a Glock 21. I still have them. Um, but I would carry both of them uh, with uh, two, 200 grain flat nose bonded full metal jackets. Right. Uh, plus P. 200 grain plus P flat nose bonded full metal jackets. And um, those actually would perform well. Even though they're 45 ACP, they penetrate you know, well because they're fast and they're a hard bullet and that kind of oh, thing. Wow. And so um, I used to carry those. Never ran into a... a, a uh, Never ran into a, 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 a grizzly bear with those, though. I did run into a moose with those, though. Yeah. And um, the moose was about to stomp us. I literally walked around the corner. Well, it's a little spike fork is about to right. stomp us. And my dog chased it off before I had to shoot. Now, let me so. correct me if I'm wrong about the Alaskan bush, but aren't there more moose attacks every year than there are bear attacks? Um, I don't know about every year, but people say it's more common. It's also more common to survive a moose attack. Right. Uh, because all you got to do is kind of get out of the way and right. hide behind something. Um, but if they get that hoof on ki and kick you anywhere in the upper portion of the back, and you, you're dead. Right. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, that's so, like, that's yeah. like I think one of that is the flight or fight re for a re reflex or response right. uh, isn't the same when people see like a moose or like if you've ever been to Yellowstone, where they have legitimate yeah. bison, not beefalo, but like 2,000, 3,000 pound bison that are the size right. of a small SUV. And people are like, oh, wow, it's like a cow. And they got to walk up to it. And this thing goes, uh-uh. And the bison attacks are the most common attacks in, in Yellowstone. But typically, you're going to live through it. It's usually, but, you know, versus if a brown bear or a mountain lion comes after you or even a black bear or even potentially an elk. Uh, that has pointy pointies, yeah. uh, you know, during the rut. Yeah. So I I don't know. It, that's an interesting thing to think about. I yeah. in, in my bug out bag, my wife and I we have a uh, Volkwarzen with the threaded barrel. Has the right. same threading as the CZ four fifty seven Pro Varmint that I own as well. So we and I have a Chaos Gear Supply aluminum suppressor that fits on both of them, and it's fantastic to shoot both of them. Like right. I can. I, I can shoot my pistol in my backyard in a suburban environment with subs, 
and no it's quieter than a, a bb gun oh yeah you know absolutely and um th- i mean that's that's a great thing but you're asking me about my bug out bag and here's something mm-hmm. i always tell people uh i always tell the people and i know it's not possible for everybody but if it's possible bug in don't bug out because you right. want to be you want to be living in your bug out area if it's right. all possible li- live in the cabin you're that you have out on some property and bug out th- so you don't have to bug out bug right. out is absolutely stupid most people including myself are not in shape for it most people don't know how to navigate through the woods especially right. that you have to worry about keeping warm Okay, that's your number one priorities are water and keeping warm when you're bugging out, right? Right. And so those are your two top priorities. And when you have those priorities, you forget about keeping clean or keeping, you know, some other priorities that are mm-hmm. going to make, make you really sick really, really fast. And um, like, especially like I think I tell people Alaska is the worst place to prep because think about all the things we have to deal with every winter. Right. Can, for six months of winter. Do you want to deal with that for six, sometimes eight months? It just depends on the thing. Do you really want to deal with that? So, like, I live I, I live in my bug out location. There are a couple of people that are coming to my house if they have to bug out of Anchorage. Uh, is it the ideal bu- bug out location? No, right. it's not. No, it's not. But I can, uh, I, can, uh, I can hold my own for a little while where we're at versus if you're roving gangs in Anchorage or a nuclear attack or – you know, all that kind of stuff. And that, that's right. what I actually fear most right now with Putin talking about nuclear weapons and stuff like that would be a nuclear attack. Uh, I'm not worried, worried about it because except when my family, my family and I commute to Anchorage on a daily basis. So, um, right. like, I worry about it while we're at there. But when we're at home, I don't worry about it so much because see, we have, I, a, we have I, a place in the basement right. where we can go and you know, where the fallout's not going to settle down. Now, we probably are on the fallout path, but, um, you know, on the winds and stuff. But mm-hmm. we have um, uh, we have a place where it's, we can go and we can s- settle in the basement and huddle there all night and those kinds of things. And we'll be um, we'll be good to go, you know, that 20 to 40, 24 to 48 hours that you got to be hidden before you uh, go out and uh, uh, do the fallout. So there's that and we have we have the pills to block your thyroid and stuff so i'm not really worried about it but like that would be the most likely situation uh i would have to have a prepping shgf situation would be a nuclear war with russia for for me because there's a military base less than 30 minutes down the road that elmendorf? is elmendorf well, well which one yeah elmendorf so yeah so I, I i live in colorado springs i'm at the a lot of people don't know this for this for your viewers um here hold on i'll grab something really quick Oh, this is heavy. So I've never shown this on my live stream, but this is uh, from when I worked inside of Cheyenne Mountain. So I I worked inside of NORAD. So So you you worked at Stargate then? Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Yeah, No, it's exactly. No, man, we we, we, we had, there was a door that we actually had the Stargate logo on, on the door (laughs) inside there. And then we also had Area 52 instead of Area 51. Yeah inside of the mountain but yeah i used i used to work there and now i will say you know australia or not australia uh, alaska that you have threats from russia i don't think you guys are going to be a hot target for a nuke i i really don't well you might know more about it than i do but all of our ballistic radars and ballistic missile systems are here so like the the, the proportionate response to hit russia most of it is here. Like you're not going to launch something from Nebraska and hit Russia right. with, without them no, without them having a long time to intercept it. So like, um, there's a lot of stuff here. I can right. I can drive on a highway and pass the missile silos, and there's always yeah. keep out, don't get right, don't you know. And then there's an old missile silo on top of a mountain in in Eagle River, um, that uh that you can hike up to and stuff right. it used to, it, and you can see it. It's an Eagle river, but you can see it from Anchorage too. Yeah. There's and also, like, you, yeah. there's also uh, close to where you're at too. Uh, in Elmendorf, there's actually a lot of command and control stations for satellites as well. Yeah. Because so, a, a lot of satellites in, in commercial or military fly in what's called a low earth sun synchronous orbit. So they fly over the poles, the North and right. South pole, every mm-hmm. time they go around the earth. Yeah. And, and if you're closer to the North pole, you're going to have a higher revisit rate than if you are closer to the equator. So you right. have a lot of command and control stations up up near where you're at. 
um, you know, yeah, there's there's definitely some strategic positioning in Alaska. I think that though, because with Russia, we have what's called mutually assured destruction or MAD. Right. And that's something that was birthed in the Cold War, where essentially, you know, Russia and America made a gentleman's agreement that if you launch a nuke, we are going to launch just as much back at you. Right. Um, so and that's, nobody wins. Yeah. yeah, nobody wins. Mutually assured and, destruction. destruction. And, yeah. I, and I agree. I just think Putin's a little bit crazy right now where he might actually do it. Like, you know what I mean? Right. So like, right. It's, e- it's easy. It's easy for me to be a, a backseat quarterback or a Sunday morning quarterback or a Monday morning quarterback, Monday quarterback. Yeah. When, when, when you've got Putin literally in your backyard, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I so mean, you, I, you, had t- you talked about it earlier. Uh, Russia put Putin or one of his ministers, um, Shergoyov, who, whatever his name is, I can't know. Uh, I don't know it very well. The um, the head of the military said we're taking back all all land that was once a part of the uh, the uh, Russian Empire. And our governor stood up to him and said, "Good luck." He he said they asked him about it. And he goes, "My only official message is good luck." Right. <laughs> so uh, yeah. you know, like, so our governor actually did that. But that was like a couple of years ago when the right. Ukraine war for, first started and was getting on the way. And uh, so. Putin was actually doing that um, and uh, like saying that. So you, you talked about it earlier. Now, am I really, really worried about Russia? No. But like, I think the most likely thing for SHG situation right now is nuclear war for, mm. for a lot of reasons. Am I really worried about me and my family dying during it? No. You know, people think nuclear bombs just level a whole city and some of them do. Uh, but the average one is a very targeted, very uh, much smaller warhead for military bases and stuff like that. There's a chance you could that if Elmendorf got hit and you were in downtown Anchorage, you could still survive if you know what to do. Yeah. Just get down under the ground and that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's, there's still a chance. The other thing I, I'd worry about more is like an economic collapse uh, if shipping stopped to Alaska because, you know, most of our food is imported. Um, mm. If shipping stopped to Alaska, there'd be a right. you know, even – even if there was a two week stop and it regained again, there'd be it'd be crap hits the fan to call the national right. guard out here. It'd be, See, I, it I, would, I've I've thought about doing like a podcast with people like yourself that like ponder on an SHTF situation and doing like a you know a bi weekly podcast where we come up with a script for different scenarios of of an event that would happen and then we sit there and address it and and have our viewers partake in it as well i just don't know if there would be the traction there because what your experience would be would be extremely different um on the majority of level than what my experience would be here in colorado springs in colorado springs i I live like in a nice suburban neighborhood that has a big concrete wall that goes around it and i mean it's a on one side it's 15 feet high because there's a highway right there so it's like a highway wall so it'd be mm-hmm. easy to set up like a perimeter with people if you said hey we're not leaving the neighborhood we're going to establish a perimeter we're going to utilize the concrete walls that are in place we're going to have strategic locations with people with walkie talkies um because cell phones are probably going to be down we'll have a charging station running off solar yada 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 but like in our neighborhood, none of the houses have wood burning fireplaces or wood burning wood stoves. It's all we all have fireplaces, but they're all gas stoves. So if right. all of a sudden it's the middle of winter and something happens and let's say an electromagnetic pulse goes off and it kills the power grid and it kills the power company and they're no longer pumping natural gas to our houses, we will no longer be able to have heat in our homes and we will have to evacuate to a different location. Um, if it's a cold winter, you know, we don't get right. Alaskan winters, but we're about to have like the, the storm of the, the, the year where they're expecting up to 48 inches or more in the mountains and like uh, uh, right. two feet of snow in Denver. You know, yeah, I've experienced that. Right. You know, where they actually canceled school several times. Um, most of the time they don't cancel school for anything. But like, you know, uh, I've been had the last eight years we had one cancel school. And then this year we've just had. The um, and last year, like there was a period of six days last year where we got eight feet of snow. Um, wow! Within that six days, uh, we were just constantly shoveling, constantly using the four wheeler, uh, the neighbor's four wheeler to push it out and stuff like that. And that just you know goes to show that you need to be in your bug out location. Yeah. Um, right. You know, uh, and your bug out location needs to have things like a wood burning stove. Um, and and those are things that um you know they're they're expensive to put in but you know they 
if you use it, you know how much money you're going to save on gas and electricity? And like, if you use it now, obviously you don't live where you can go chop your own firewood either. Um, so like I can go out with a chainsaw and an ax and uh, a splitting mall and I could have, you know, and, and just by following the law and using already down trees, I could have enough firewood for a few years, you know? Right. Um, and I could go out and do that. But, uh, and if I wanted to break the law and not use and cut down trees, I could have a lot more. I could cut down five or six trees. We'd have enough, um, right. wood for the whole neighborhood. Uh, that's, I don't, see, that's, I don't that's, plan on doing that, but right. yeah. That's um, well. That's like a whole topic too that I'd like if we ever did like a podcast, which is at what point do state, local, or federal laws no longer apply to your day to day living in like a bug out situation? Now, I'm not trying to get into the, that podcast with you right now, so I want my viewers to be ex- to be exposed to you. But that is like a question of uh, that I've always kind of wondered is when does that law no longer apply in a situation? I got one answer for that real quick. All right. Well, a few years ago, the, um, I think it was the Obama administration. It could have been, um, Biden or it was the, is the department of the interior or something. EPA said that there's too many wood burning stoves moving, uh, burning, uh, stuff into burning, uh, carbon monoxide into the air in Alaska, too many wood burning stoves. So, my point is I'm already past that point. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, and, and right. I, don't, I, I have a wood burning stove. I don't actually have it hooked up yet. I'm going to build a few more things down here, like right. a, wall, a wall between my reloading room and the gunpowder and the wood burning stove. It's something I'm going to build. I'm in a completely, a completely unfinished basement here. So I think it's probably a good idea not to have my gunpowder ne- near a wood burning stove. It's probably a good idea. You know, I mean, I'll go quick if I don't do it. So, you know, so, uh, right, right. yeah, that's that. Uh, but yeah, that, so I, there are time, there are certain things where you're already past that point of, uh, of government intervention. Yeah. Yeah. At what point do you illegally right. illegal now, but what point do you illegally make your own 22 suppressor and can, you know, right. you know, it's like, if you don't make it before shit hits the fan, right. then you don't know how to use it. But if you make it before shit hits the fan, right. You've got 10 years of jail. So, right. And I have not made one ATF if you're listening. <laughs> Listen up, Alphabet Boys. Yeah, I know. It was like my wife and I, we were at a gun show here in Colorado Springs several years ago. Uh, this was like back in 2020 or 2021. I think it was 2021. And this was uh, before I owned my Chaos Gear Supply Hydra 22 suppressor. And mm-hmm. there was a booth there selling selling solvent traps. Oh, yeah. With, with jigs. And I did not buy one, but I told my wife, I was like, I guarantee those were feds. I guarantee those are feds at, oh, the, yeah. at this yeah. thing, you know? Yeah, especially since in 2021, that's when they started cracking down on those. Yep, yep. So I guarantee those are feds, you know? Yeah. But, but they still give you the advertisement on Facebook for it, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, yeah, so back to your original question of, like, yeah. bugging out. Um, those would be my four guns I would bug out with. Okay. Um, but I would be planning on bugging out in a vehicle no matter where I went. Right. Um, um, if I have to go on foot, first of all, I've got some back and nervous issues. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm really limited on how far I can go on foot and that mm-hmm. would limit my family, how far they can go on foot right. and it would limit what we could bring. Um, so like, again, if, if, if there's anything about SHTF that your listeners want to know, live in your bug out location, right? That's a good point. Absolutely. Live in your bug out location. If you can't and you have a cabin that you're going to or you have a spot in the mountains that you've picked and that's where you're going, you need to store as much stuff there as you can. That's because, smart. Because bugging out is dumb because you're leaving, leaving all the resources you have. So unless you're going to resources ahead right. of other people getting there, right? it's a dumb idea to bug out. It's like – but I mean – my hunting bags, when it's not hunting season, stay stay packed as bug out bags. All right, but you know, for me, commuting back and forth between a major city, um, you know, a get home bag is smarter than a bug out bag, right? By by far. So just something to think about. You know, I could I could literally dig a hole with an entrenchment tool, and build an igloo or enough snow to deal with fallout. Mm. But uh, if I bu- if I have to bug out, and they're still launching nukes. Fallout's not a, you know, I, you know, living where there's a basement as opposed to going out in the woods is way smarter on, on any type of SHTF scenario. I agree. 
Yeah, especially because. So, and and one of the reasons why this has kind of been a hot hot button topic for people here in Colorado is something I've been bringing up too. Is with the the thought of potentially like a civil war, right? Right. Uh, what are going to be the most contested states? Where 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 is this the war? So, like during you know the first civil war in the United States, it was like the Mason Dixon line, you know, and that that whole area and and the center part of the East Coast was where they fought a lot of those wars at. Right. Uh, but I, I think the next one is going to be fought heavily at the Continental Divide, especially here in Colorado, because a lot of the watershed that goes west on the Continental Divide feeds Arizona, Nevada and ca- the lower half of California and heavily right. populated areas. Um, and I really see like if, if you were to be one side or the other and you were to able to control the Continental Divide, from Colorado all the way up through Idaho into Montana or, or, or not Montana. Maybe it is a little bit of Montana on the Western side. Um, yeah. Wyoming through, through that area, man, you would control a lot of that watershed and, and you could really affect people on the coast or in the middle of the country as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could definitely do that. So what I see happening more is Missouri during the civil war. All mm-hmm. right. Missouri had a pro-union governor and pro-union um, legislature. The people that didn't uh, want to go along with that, because Missouri was a slave state, okay, but it never officially succeeded from the union. So they formed two different legislatures and two different governors and basically stayed in their state and fought each other. Mm-hmm. That's what I see happening for the next civil war. Uh, mm-hmm. I see a lot more, oh, my neighbor has a uh, Trump sign up. I'm going to go to attack his house. Like, right. um, and I am, I am very libertarian when it comes to the pol- politics. I think, you know, voting for Trump is like eating a turd and voting for Biden's like eating diarrhea. Um, and, and I know that's an extreme example, but like, I think, you know, Trump, Trump right. had nine, $9.5 trillion in debt that he didn't veto. And he, uh, was, you know, promoting red flag laws. Now Biden is infinitely worse. Don't get me wrong, but I'm, t- I'm tired of voting for the lesser of two evils, Right. you know? And so mm. it, and the Libertarian Party, if they would just run a pro-life Libertarian, they'd win. You know, um, the, yeah. they'd run Rand Paul. If Rand Paul was at the top of the Libertarian ticket, right. they'd at least have enough votes to be in the next debate. I used to be a part so. of the Libertarian Party, and I used to donate and do work with them and stuff like that. I, I started to peel off, though, when they were all about open borders. Um, I, I, yeah. I, and that open border stuff is a Libertarian that's eventually what drove me out of the party was the open border stuff. Right. And then also too, you know, I used to think that drug use was a victimless crime if you're personally doing it and whatnot. But now I live in Colorado. I don't know, John Wick, if you're still in here, uh, he's, he's a local nine, four, five industries rep, just like I am here in Colorado Springs. Uh, right. He puts out really good content, but we, we, we talk about it, but in Colorado, since they've legalized, not just marijuana, but they've, they've essentially decriminalized, hard drug use right. the the amount of drug use is so open and so rampant now in colorado springs pueblo and denver the three major cities on the front range mm-hmm. it's it's starting to i lived in california before I, I was stationed in california with the air force not by choice but that's where the government had me and then the government moved me here to right. colorado it is starting to feel worse to me in Colorado than it did when I lived in California. Now, granted, I see videos of what California has turned into, and it just it, it's crazy to me how bad it's gotten now in California. But Colorado is quickly on a downward, you know, snowballing effect that's getting larger and larger with the more liberal laws they're creating for lax crime punishments. Like, for example, gun controls. They have 15 bills on the gun control docket this year for the House and the state to vote on. Uh, One of them was put up by Republicans saying, if you steal a firearm Uh intentionally, it is a felony. And the Democrats said, nope, we won't allow that to happen. We are not going to make it a felony to steal a firearm. But what we're going to do instead is try to push laws that make it a felony to purchase a firearm own one legally or carry it with a license in 80% of the state. So it just blows me away, that type of stuff. I'm not trying to get into a lot of politics on this, but Colorado, Colorado was known as the libertarian state. 
This was like the, the, the birthplace of the Libertarian Party. Originally, the Libertarians were a penguin, and then they became a porcupine for the, their right. you know stuff. And I, I was really involved. I was going to move back to New Hampshire because they did the whole Free State Project up there. And they right. did a great job at, tr at turning New Hampshire into a Libertarian-style state, which I think was fantastic. But I just have a lot of issues now, especially because I have family in Houston, Dallas, Austin, Fort Worth, um, right. in Texas, and the open border stuff is is creating a lot of issues. No, mm -hmm. no, uh, I don't care if that's law. But if you get right for marijuana, uh, if they know you're high right now, or if it was in your system thirty days ago, there's right. still not a great test for that, right? And so I definitely, I definitely think that like libertarian, like I call myself a conservative libertarian. I would vote for the Rand Pauls and the Thomas Masseys and the people mm -hmm. that don't want big government. But you still have to have, you know, laws in place. And, and libertarians are all about choice, but yet you deny choice to hundreds of thousands of choices to an unborn baby, you know, or preborn baby. Uh, so, like, you can't be about choice and be about that. You know what I mean? Right. So, like, uh, I get it. Like, the economy should be free choice, libertarian. If somebody defrauds you, you sue them. Or you arrest them or you like that, like the government should be there to only to support fraud in business. That's the only thing they should, you know, to not support it. Um, that's what they do now. They support fraud, fraud in business. Um, they should be <laughs> there only to stop fraud in business. Um, <laughs> let me I, rephrase that. So, uh, yeah, we got, yeah. we circled the wagons and made it work. Yep. I get you. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, that that's kind of my libertarianism. Like, uh, you know, like you want gay couples to get married. Okay. Don't make my church marry them. You know, right. um, you know, like it, it's a, like if you want them to get married, great. Find a ship captain, find a church that doesn't believe in the Bible and get married. Right. You know, um, but like, don't let my church ma make don't force my church to marry. Right. Them, you know, right. and so that's a little in Colorado's home of Masterpiece Bakery, that guy that got sued by the state and took it to, you know, the Supreme Court and won. Right. You know, and, they, and they're still messing with them. They, I mean, they're yep. still bringing cases up against that guy. You know, it's yep. it, and he's still fighting against the system. I mean, it, it's he, he needs to uh, take a hint from Granby, Colorado. Yeah, yeah, yeah Granby. Buy, <laughs> you talking about the killdozer? He needs to buy a bulldozer. Yeah, a huge killdozer. I know, man. Yeah. Didn't didn't Whistling Diesel just buy himself like one of those giant old cats? Something I think, like that. Yeah. yeah. And everybody was like, "Oh, killdozer 2.0." You know, put yeah. in a bigger radiator and some other stuff, a better navigation system. Yeah, um, there you go. Yeah, that's that's kind of crazy. That was that was a crazy story of that whole killdozer. Um, yeah. Well, let me let me ask you this though. What got you into? So you said you started off with the music YouTube stuff. What got you into the firearm YouTube stuff? I think about doing it for a while. So I just went to my local range. I have some absolutely horrible videos from my um, local range. Uh, I would just go there, set up my camera, and I would just film what guns got over the chronograph and i would just literally film it mm -hmm. and i would just um like i just started doing that I mean, like we're gonna see what these get over the chronograph and you know that kind of thing and it got a few views here and there but it wasn't much but uh you know i think uh when one or two videos started to take off which uh was um the first one was my uh the magpul stock on a 700 uh that one started to take off and that that one um, it's monetized by YouTube. Um, and I don't know how it's got over a hundred thousand views. It was the, my first video to get over a hundred thousand views. Wow. And uh, I showed it doing to an ADL. So a gun that did not have an external magazine, taking the Magpul stock, taking the internals out and putting in a detachable box magazine. And I don't have that gun with me down here. It's not one of the ones I brought. Oh, wow. Um, but, uh, you know, I had a seven mag and the, it was a Remington and Remington's quality there for a while it was a little crappy, right? It would not feed every round, like it jam up and everything like that, but it shot three eighths of an inch. So the barrel was good, but the internal mechanism wasn't, and it was just that spring. And uh, so I put it in a Magpul stock and made it very heavy. That Magpul stock's very heavy. Now I got my 11 and a half pound, 11 and a half pound gun. I'm car I've carried it 15 miles one day. And uh, like that kind of just got me into the YouTube was when that success was there um, and just, I think the other thing about talking about guns with people, um, responding to people, people, you know, starting to support me and stuff like that, I, you know, got really humbled. Um, I really decided to put a lot more into it. Um, 
because I, I had qualified for monetization for years and I refused to do it, right? Uh, because I didn't want to deal with all the crap. And so one day uh, I applied because Chute convinced me to apply. And then I went, nah, I never do that. And I never, they mail you that, uh, they snail mail you that uh, that code, right? And um, I just never opened that envelope. I think I shredded it and t- put it away. I'm like, I'm just not, <laughs> yeah. not going to deal with it. If I can get three to four hundred bucks a month on Patreon, I can support the channel. Never have, still don't get that, by the way. And uh, eventually, they put ads on my videos despite me doing that. So they were like, and they said I was earning money. They monetized my channel without my per- full permission. <laughs> So most most YouTubers are dealing with the d- the demonetization. I got monetized without my permission. So without my full permission. And I've heard of a couple of other people like huh. secondhand. Um Fit and Fire knew somebody that, that happened to same story. Like oh they went through half the process and decided no, I don't want to deal with it. And um you know and so that kind of got me into it is when I could actually make a difference and pay off bills for my family. Like my very first 200 bucks from YouTube. I had no idea how I was going to pay for my um, passport because we were going to go out to um, we were going to go out to uh, uh, the Bahamas on a cruise. And I had Mm. no idea how I was going to pay for expedited passport. And I looked in my account and the YouTube money came in that day. And so once I realized I could actually make a difference for my family and pay down credit card debt and pay down, you know, stuff like that, I like got into seriously taking the YouTube serious and upping my production quality not having a flash, I, like I used to have my O lights like slanted up on something, <laughs> and now I've got like a real recording light and stuff like that. Nice. Um, yeah, so it's um like that. Just getting into that shooting channel was just uh you know it's been a process, and like I was doing it every day there for every week for a while, and now I put up a video once one or two videos every month, uh, long form videos, um because you know how it is the young kids just you know. If you, if you don't edit when they're asleep, you don't get any time to edit, and I want to go to sleep, so there's that. Uh, so now I'm just, uh, you know, producing a bunch of, of stuff now and then, um, but, like, it, I guess, like I was telling you earlier, the thing that got me in the most is when my legs started hurting. I had pain where I couldn't walk a lot, uh, and I had to justify getting my guns, uh, uh, keeping all my guns, you know, and so, like, I could get more guns, but what's the point if I can't go hunting? I can get more guns, but what's the point if all I can do is go to the range and sit down at a bench, you know? And so I was like, you know, why don't, why don't we put this information out there? Like, I guess the, the inspiration for my channel was Ballistics by the Inch website, where they cut cut the barrel two inches and, oh, yeah. You, know, yeah. you know, the website. Um, they have a great website, like, if you want to know about anything. And I was like, well, why don't we do it in video format? Because people don't like, in general, people don't like to read. Mm-hmm. You can do it in video, if you can do it in video, we can do that, so. I had experience from YouTube, from the car dealership, and I've been doing YouTube. Uh, I've been doing the music writing thing, and I had about 200 subscribers. So, okay. um, so that's that. So, I decided, hey, I like my guns. Let's every gun I can get a hold of. Let's go shoot it over a chronograph and kind of take. Um, I will tell you this. So, I converted my Glock 21 to 45 Super, right? Oh wow! And um, not a, not a hard conversion. There's some difficulties getting it to run. Um, it still doesn't run perfectly all the time. I, like if I hand it to somebody else and they don't have an extremely strong grip, um, I'm not talking about a limp wrist. I'm talking like they're 85 percent of a of a really good grip. Um, like it's going to jam on them, right? Um, so I'm thinking about converting it back. Um, and that's one of the guns I brought down here to show you because it's the only gun I've shot a grizzly bear in the head with. Oh um, wow. Did um, it kill it? I, uh, yeah. Oh, well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> we'll <laughs> talk about that later. Uh, um, uh, it, it was probably dead, but it was reflex breathing. So, and I was hunting by myself, so I didn't, I didn't like that. Um, but like what really got me into the YouTube was, uh, like I, I, I posted a video of my 45 super conversion on my music channel and it got like 5,000 views, which I hadn't done before on my music channel. And so like, I was like, Hmm. Well, that's interesting. The classical music isn't getting the millions of views I wanted, nor did I really expect it to. Let's go to the guns. You know, mm-hmm. my other my other passion and hobby might be able to like at least pay for itself right. um, someday. Um, and that's about to the point where it's at right now, as it pays for itself, generally speaking. That's, ta- that's I interesting. Ta- yeah, I, I tried. I tried at first. I was going to do like a motorcycle YouTube channel. 
And I just realized at that point, without owning a motorcycle dealership, there was no way that I was going to financially be able to make that channel work. Unless I wanted to get into just adventure videos where I'm driving all over the country and people, it's like a lifestyle blog video. But I yeah, said that just wasn't going to be feasible for me because when I started my channel it was back in like 2011 and I really started posting videos in like 2013, 14, while well, I was still in the military and that just wasn't feasible. And then I finally got out of the military and I was like, well, maybe I'll do like a self-help, you know, transitioning after the military channel. And then that didn't really work. And then I made some Glock 43X videos and those just kind of blew up in a bad way. I got a lot of hate for the making those. Uh, but that's that's kind of where I ended up had kind of it's it's just weird how YouTube kind of forced me into where I'm at now, but I've also enjoyed it because I love firearms. I love yeah, I love guns. Go. And it yeah. does it's it, am I breaking even? Absolutely not. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think I don't think you know, I think Steven from Bullets for Bucks, you know, he's got hundred and fifty thousand subscribers now. And when he did my podcast about a month ago, he said he just now is starting to break even. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um yeah um i'll talk to you more about that but the youtube money doesn't necessarily break me even but the the combination of the affiliate links and youtube mm -hmm. and some other stuff breaks it even do you have um, problems with any of your affiliates like getting paid from them or having them recognize sales so yeah they uh there's so a lot of times they don't recognize the sale uh like i'll have friends that tell me oh i used your uh, affiliate to so and so and so I'll go through there and they didn't recognize the sale. What happens is you have cookies and most of us turn the cookies off because we want privacy, right? Well, with the cookies are turned off, you don't get the traction for the sale. Gotcha. Like there's, there's no way to prove it. And like, um, that's, that's the issue. So they, if you can't prove it, uh, if you can't take their order number, uh, like I had a bunch of people say, Oh, I just bought one on one of the places I posted it. I'm like, Oh, I didn't get any credit. Can I have your order number? They're like, no. Because well, they don't want my, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I don't blame them. Like yeah. I wouldn't give them my order m number either. And so, right. like, um, like there's a lot of things. People have their cookies turned off, and you're not going to get traction with that. Right, just, I know. Um, it's, I'm kind of running into that right now with an affiliate program because it's weird. Yeah. Because this affiliate program, I have three times the amount of clicks as mm -hmm. I do combined with all of my other affiliate programs. But I've had zero sales from their clicks. And the crazy part is, is like, I've purchased multiple things. I've had other content creators reach out to me and they're like, hey, dude, I purchased a thousand rounds of nine with your affiliate link. Did you get the credit for that? Because they know what's up. And then I reach out to their, their representative and I'm like, hey, I've made several purchases. People that I know of making purchases. Why aren't I getting recognition? I've gotten the clicks. I've gotten the clicks, you know, it's, it's the, right. the click numbers are insane, but why aren't I getting the recognition? So I was just kind of wondering if you've run into that yourself. Yeah, I've ran into that. Like I've had, um, there's, there's one in particular, I won't mention their name online. The, um, I will say that the going through the protest profit process on Avant link, if you're on Avant. Yep. Link, yep. That's what I'm and, on. Uh, going through their actual protest process that they have is the way to go. Okay. Um, that don't email the, the rep don't email the rep or anything be like um it's like just um the only time i email reps is when i ask for something to to test on the channel that's the okay. only time i email reps uh and if you're an affiliate link with them and you've gotten a bunch of clicks like they don't care about the sales necessarily but you've gotten a bunch of clicks they'll generally give you stuff and uh i've had i've actually had places that didn't give me a lot of clicks i didn't get a lot of clicks because uh, i have because I test body armor, I've had every every single body armor company as an affiliate, right? Mm -hmm. And um, like, you know, um, they'll send you they'll send you body armor. Um, but I had to buy the first few body armors for my test in order to get those affiliates. Right, um, that makes so, sense. You know, you know, so it's uh, but you know, I've mo the majority of armor I've shot now is been donated not all of it but uh it's been donated to the channel so that that's that's where the real benefit comes in is developing the relationship with the company right and so if you develop develop the relationship with the company right then you'll be okay but you know i actually shot enough body armor that uh tacticon armament who makes them for the idf uh they emailed me and asked me to shoot body armor with the with the steel tips in the 22 250 really um, that's yeah. awesome taking that m855a1 steel tip you guys used 
and loading it into 22250 and get it going about 3600 feet per second you know yeah um, how did it, how yeah. did it fare how did it fare well, I don't want to spoil it for everybody. Oh, so no. this is something big. All right, no, 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 no. That no, was no. that was that no, was like no. one of my next I, questions was what do you, what's big coming down the pipeline that that you think well, your no, viewers no. All, are going to be excited about? All of those videos are done and they're up. Um, it's um, I guess what's coming down the pipeline though is uh, why I'm going back to 308 over 65 Creedmoor. That's that's going to be the big one coming up. And then I have a Strybog versus CMMG Banshee 10 millimeter video coming up. Uh, that comes out Saturday, and the other one will come out the next week, I think. So is it that? Um, that's the X Strybog, right? Uh, yeah, it's the ten millimeter. It's the SP ten A three. Okay. Um, so it's a ten millimeter Strybog. Um, so you're the second content creator that I've I've done the podcast with in less than a month that has the Strybog, and the other guy loves his. I don't know. Do you like yours? Uh, well, I'm borrowing it from Chuk. Oh, okay. Chuk's Outdoor Adventures. Um, I like it. Um, I don't love it. Okay. Uh, as you'll see, it can be ammo picky. Um, okay. As any delayed or any blowback Roller. action. Roller. Okay. I don't remember exactly. It just says delayed blowback on their okay. on their uh, thing. It doesn't tell me if it's roller or radial delayed or what what it is. Um, but the Strybog, uh, it can be ammo picky, and you'll see. Gotcha. You'll see why Saturday. Um, but yeah. But so the twenty two to answer your original question, how did that fare? Um, it'll give you some back face deformation. But here's the problem. So these are steel-tipped bullets, like M855 and M855A1. They have a steel conical penetrator in the front of the bullet, right? Um, the M855 is, like, painted green and probably, I think it's covered and doesn't have a true tungsten core. Um, neither one of these have a tungsten core, all right? And so what happens is, it's when they're going that fast, they act like a Barnes TTSX. That that. Uh, steel acts like a ballistic tip and pushes down into the copper and forces it to open up. And so the steel might come out the side of the body armor, but generally speaking, it slows down so fast because it loses the mass of its, of its core, right? It slows down so fast um, that the faster you send that, the faster the bullet's going to break up. Interesting. So Interesting. That, you know, is against steel armor, like level three plus, it'll go right through it like a hot knife through butter. Like uh, the 22 to 50 went four out of the five <laughs> rounds I tested yeah. went right, right uh. through it. <laughs> I did, I did like a 40 grain full metal jacket right. going like 4,200 feet per second. Right. Um, and it went right through a steel panel. Have you seen um, that comedy short? You just kind of reminded me of that one where it's the guy dressed as an ATF agent. And he goes, Hey, are those legal? Level. Are those level four plates? <laughs> yeah, level. And I don't care who you buy them from. Level four plates are going to stop any realistic threat that a civilian can hand load and hit you with. Right. Except for armor piercing 338 Lapua, if you can find the bullets, or armor piercing 50 BMG. Those are the only two things that a civilian can. Right can kind of get their hands on these right days. but people so. people also don't even realize though too because if, if you've seen the ballistic impacts of like a heavy 338 lapua that's in the 400 plus grains or a 750 yep. uh b at 50 bmg uh even if you have armor on and it's not penetrating into your body it can still really can still do a lot of damage yeah so here's the thing like so crumple zones and cars uh, force you to take a lot of the uh, um, take away a lot of the foot pounds of the car crash, right? Right. But even into the cabin of the car, you survive m more foot pounds than uh, way more than most rifles, except the exception being 50 BMG. Right. Um, so if you're in a 40 mile an hour car crash where you hit the brakes and you're slowing down and you crash into somebody, your body has absorbed. Because you think about it, the bullet's going thousands of times faster than the car, right? Mm -hmm. But the car weighs trillions of times more. And so I don't know if you know the energy formula off the top of your head, but it's bullet, it's feet per second squared times bullet weight over a constant, which is 450,240. Okay. And if you do that, if you transfer that car's weight into grains, and there are 7,000 grains in a pound, right? Right. So you have a 2,200 pound car. You multiply 2,200 times 7,000. Mm -hmm. You put that in the formula, and you transfer 40 miles an hour to feet per second, which I don't know exactly what that is off the top of my head. You have way more energy than any firearm is going to produce. Right. right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
So you have way more energy. And I don't know exactly how much of that gets transferred to the cab and to your seat. Um, hopefully not much, because that's what crumple zones are for. And that's why right. people live through, live through car accidents they, sh- they wouldn't have lived through in the past. But you still get a lot more foot pounds than the average firearm is gonna gonna hit you with right and now, so, now granted though because of those those crumple zones it does disperse right. the the is blunt trauma, trauma over right. a larger area versus correct and that's what body armor is designed to do right but modern modern ceramic body armor disperses a lot of that, that right. to you. so yeah you could get hit with a three like i load those mada ones in 300 wind mag and they have way over four thousand feet uh foot pounds of energy okay wow with my long barrel 300 wind mag which i've got with me here it's uh, got, um, it's got like, it's with the max charge of Reloader 17, which I can't find anymore, uh, is getting 3782 feet per second in a 28-inch okay. 28 28 barrel. It's only supposed to get 36, but I have a longer barrel, and it's a slower burning powder. It builds up a lot of pressure. Um, so it's going nearly 3,800 feet per second, and it's a steel tip, and it will leave, m- modern body armor stops it, though, and it will leave a softball size uh, impact on the back of that armor and yeah you, you're doing that but i proved it on the channel if you put just a trauma pad behind that maybe two maybe a 3a pistol flexible pad pistol and a trauma pad you could possibly live it is possible yeah you'll probably be knocked out uh you might have some bruised organs uh but it is possible for you to live if you had a trauma pad beneath that and that's four thousand foot pounds of energy well, that's and that's I, the whole thing. Like when my buddies were in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, that they had they had their plate carriers, right? But then they uh, also they had like a um, a ceramic plate that would go on the front, and that was like their that was their one time. You know, it was useful for like one impact, is what it was. Yeah. That's what they're officially rated for. Most tr- most ceramic plates can take yeah. four to six impacts easily if if they're spaced out. Okay. Um, I tested one once, and it was just blowing chunks out of the plate, but it caught the bullets. And um, and if anybody wants to see this, it's on my LA Police Gear review. I had a 223 here and a 308 here. Okay, right. so I had like a full, full metal jacket and then a green tip here. Stopped both of them, but it blew a lot of the chunk out of the plate. Cheap Chinese made plate. I put a 308 Winchester right between them. Stopped it too. Wow. And then I then I did my 300 Win Mag and 22 250 on the bottom of the plate. It stopped everything. So then let's. I, yeah. So I had this eaten out section of the front that was like this wide, and it's nothing but the back of the of the armor plate is showing because it's been chunked out. Right. I shot nine millimeter extreme penetrators in there with the Glock forty three X, and it stopped every one of those. That's crazy. That's crazy. So like like modern body armor is really good. All right. The, the worst thing about modern modern body armor is that it, are the gaps that it leaves. All right. So Did let's. You, yeah. That, yeah. Well, that's that's the whole thing. A lot of soft operators now are kind of knocking the. Uh, tactical cowboys on youtube that are you know with your ar-15 they want you know they're they're all hunched over like this and they're like well when you do that you're reducing the actual surface area exposed by your your trauma plate and also your 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 soft body armor and now you're 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 by by reducing that surface area you're reducing the potential to actually catch the bullets and you're you're opening up more vital organs so a lot, that's one of the reasons why you're seeing now with a lot of the soft operators that are coming out on the YouTubes, they're doing the high risers with uh, like an aim point or a red dot on top of an AR to keep your head up like this. So you have right. better situational awareness, but it's forcing you to keep your body in a more upright position um, so that your, your body armor is being exposed versus your vitals. Um, you know, right. so it's, it's, it's a weird ebb and flow. It seems with, with the way training goes. Now, let me ask you this, since you're becoming kind of like an authoritative source on testing body armor for the viewers out there that are watching, let's say that haven't watched your channel. What are some of the things that you should look for to say, okay, this is legit. This is something that would actually save my ass versus, Oh, this is a Timu, you know, plate carrier, and I should probably be leery of spending three dollars and fifty cents on level four bar- body armor. Like, what? Well, what think, are the things to look for? I think you just covered it. Is make sure you're buying from a legitimate site who's a legitimate gun site. So, LA Police Gear, Botac have the cheapest prices, generally speaking. Like, I bought my LA Police Gears for like one nineteen each, and I'm running them right now because that's what I could afford. And um, like, and because I pulled all the other body armor out of my carrier to shoot. Um, but like, um, and the Botax, like were, they were 
on sale last year for ninety nine dollars, and now they're uh, now they're they're uh, that. But I'd just say look for YouTube videos that with that armor. Like I'd never heard of Tacticon Armament until they sent me out some stuff, and they have like right. they request they requested me to shoot their plate with the twenty two two fifty steel tips, and uh, I responded back. I'm like, if it's a level four plate, you're gonna be dis- I mean, you're gonna be happy because level four is gonna it's gonna go right through. You know, uh, it's, it's not gonna go through anything. Um, I shot it with both the green, the 22 to 50 and the 300 wind mag. And, uh, and then I, then they sent me the, the, uh, trauma pad. I put it up against some ballistics gel and there was damage on the ballistics gel from the 22 to 50 and the 300 wind mag. When I put the trauma pad beneath it, there was no damage. Wow. Um, so those trauma pads really do work, especially in ceramic. You really need to wear them. If you're doing steel armor, then what you really need to wear is a three, a protector on right. top of your Soft armor. body. Stop on your and you need to get some really good windshield glue and glue it on top of your steel armor so that the fragments don't go everywhere. So that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but uh, and our wrap is even better. But by the time you spend the money on steel armor, the wrap and everything else, right? Uh, the glue and the wrap and the 3A armor to mm-hmm. go on top of it, you might as well have bought a four, level four plate. Right. Well, let, let me let me ask you this then, because we're talking about the pitfalls of, of people getting into buying body armor and they might see a price tag on it and be like, holy crap, that's a lot of money. I'm going to go for something cheaper and maybe from a lesser known organization that starts right. with like, you know, Chinese lettering. Right. And you're kind of like, eh, don't don't go that way. But at the same time, too. Uh, being somebody that was in the military, actually knowing what the cost of, of this type of stuff is, I see the other end of pitfalls as well, where you go into and, and not to talk bad on a company that I'm an affiliate with, but Shields, for example, Shields sells body armor and I'm an affiliate for Shields. I love the store. I spend way too much money there, but they definitely know there are like boutique items that people that are kind of like right leaning or whatnot will go into the store and they'll be like, wow, look, there's a backpack for my kid that has level three body armor in it. It's $500. Wow. That's a great deal for level three body armor in a backpack. Um, not, but yeah, yeah. No, no, well, you get what I'm saying. Like, yeah. so what are, what are some, what, what's the opposite end of the pitfalls then that people should be looking for, for, okay, now you're being sold, you know, snake oil, so to speak. Yeah. So I would say, um, don't buy body armor that you can't find easily sit in the store on your phone and find type in the name of the body armor and find a couple of reviews on it. Um, the best reviews on body armor are by Buffman range. I don't know if you've had heard of mm-hmm. him or all right. He, he is the best tester of body armor on YouTube. He does everything scientific. He breaks out. It's uh, yeah, it's B U F F M A N. And then range is an acronym. I don't know what it stands for, but it's R dot A R dot N R. And it's um, range, um, Buffman range. And uh, I just misspelled range right there, didn't I? Anyway, um, like he has the clay backer. Uh, he can't heat it. It's outside, so he can't heat it to the proper temperature for the clay. Um, but other than that, everything's, you know, pretty much like an NIJ tested laboratory. And they um, uh, like he tests every. Body, there are body armors on there I have never heard of, and like, mm-hmm. so if you can't find one of his videos, if you can't find Mister Guns and Gear, who does more of the redneck testing like I do, right? Um, and I bought some because Mister Ge- the the Botac I bought from uh, Botac. Are you talking about Mike? Yeah, Mike from Mister yeah. Guns and Gear. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then um, Matt over at Buffman Range. Like, if you can find body armor uh, test, and he actually gets a lot more things to go through occasionally than I do. Oh, really? um, but like he's he's like me he shoots it with stuff that's over the threat um and he likes to he like he'll shoot everything that's a threat on one plate right and then things that are over that threat rating on another part plate so what what about let's let's talk then a little bit about threat ratings because one of my favorite cartridges from the past uh and then and we're gonna wrap this up for the live portion and go over to the the just a recorded portion so we could do the show and tell because it is getting a little later. But one of the things that I used to love is the five seven back when you could actually get like five seven black tip or whatever it was called or right. Um, you know, how how actually armor piercing were those rounds when they came out? Okay. Mm. Beyond six or something like that. When definitely not five seven the black tips were only gonna go through level pistol rated armor, I believe. It was a chance that they could go through like an already hit or a mild steel level three. 
is there a chance? Sure. Um, especially if it's already hit and compromised, but I don't think it's right. going through. Um, I don't think it's going through it, anything else. Uh, I've, I've got point. I've got a video where I tested out some AR five hundred qu quarter inch steel, and I mm -hmm. shot it with a thirty out six, and I had some Barnes one hundred and eighty grain MRX, which was Barnes yeah. first. Right. tungsten steel core copper coated bullets or copper jacketed and uh -huh. um surprisingly it, it, they put a really big goose egg on the right side of the ar500 really big but then i shot it with some 150 grain soft point dude it just put a hole it didn't even put a goose egg that soft yeah, point punched yep. a hole straight through that arm that ar500 so okay ceramic is more about bullet construction Okay. Um, so if you were going against level th and they do make level three and level three plus ceramic armor. So like for your audience that doesn't know. Okay. So level one is like, basically no it'll stop nothing. Right. Maybe a bow and arrow, a BB right. gun or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, level two is a uh, subsonic nine millimeter, I believe. Um, so like your old flak vest from the nineties were level two shrapnel from a grenade subsonic nine millimeter, um, from a pistol, not a, not a carbine. Um, oh, wow. And then, um, cause it may gain enough velocity. It wasn't subsonic at the time. That's a long ballistic discussion. We won't talk about, uh, then you have, you have this weird system and they're trying to correct it with the new RF one, RF two, RF three, RF four system. Uh, so you had level three, a, which would stop up to a two forty grain jacketed soft point 44 Magnum and would stop most 12 gauge threats. Cause they're not going, they're going about the same speed as pistols. Right. And that's why, uh, you know, they can stop it is because they're going about the same speed as pistols and that was level 3a but then you had level three which would stop m80 ball okay so basically essentially any of your 147 to 150 grain full metal jacket uh some of them were uh they were all lead core but in 80 ball some of them had a steel jacket and then a copper jacket wrapped around that called a bimetal jacket and um those it was supposed to stop six shots of those Oh wow! Uh, st and uh, steel, uh, six well placed, well spaced shots of that. Um, and then you had level three plus that's come out in the last few years, which was specifically made to stop all five, five, six rounds, including green tip, because right. those green tips would go right through. Right. And so would M8, or excuse me, so would M one ninety three out of a long barrel, because speed defeats steel. And if you can get it up to that, th that bullet's going to go right through level three. So level three plus. They came out with that, and every level three plus that I've shot has stopped 55 grain from a 20-inch barrel and has stopped 62 grain steel penetrators. If I want to go through level three plus, I've got to break out the uh, 22 250. What do you think about uh, SS-109, the 62 grain uh, steel penetrators? Um, yeah, I, I think they're great to stock up if you have 20-inch barrels because they were supposed to shred the jacket. And so you get kind of that hollow point effect there, and you're supposed to get penetration. Uh, but if you do not have a 20 inch barrel, you're not going to get any of that effect. Oh, really? And so, um, not out at distance, not between 75 and 200 yards. So that, so the 14 and a half inch M4 or some of the shorter barrels, even than that is what they had problems with in blackout down. They could shot the guy 15 down yeah, over in Somalia, black Hawk down that scenario. Um, there's many testimonies. They could shoot the guy several times. They were laughing at one of the older guys who was carrying an M1A, one of the special forces or an M14. Why are you carrying the M14? Why are you carrying the M14? They didn't laugh at them no more when they saw one shot putting those guys down that were high on cot, you know? Yeah. Um, so, um, and, you know, I'm, I was never in the military like you. Thank you for your service. But, like, uh, y'all wouldn't take me, I promise. Um, but, like, having read up on all the ballistics, it's like you need a 20-inch barrel if you're shooting an uh, M855. Or oh, really? A 22-inch barrel would be better. Um, so, like, if you're uh, – that's why I have mostly – and I've always had a 20-inch barrel AR. Like, uh, if you if you're in a fixed position and you're shooting M855 A1s, you want a 20 inch barrel AR. You don't want a, a 16 inch barrel or a 14. Yeah, you want to 30. squeeze as much velocity out of it as possible. Right, and uh, an 18 will do okay. So we've uh, I've I've done some ballistic testing with an 18. Um, this was way before the channel when I lived in Mississippi. My buddy had an 18 inch, and so we fired some green tips out of the 18 inch, and he would get the effect of the of the jacket shredding he would get that at you know 75 to 100 yards um past that he wouldn't get it but the m4 the 16 inch you know past 30 to 50 yards wouldn't get it um you know 
Wow. Two and a half, 16 inches. It so, and that's, that and that's so. just a, so that's one of the things that Grand Thumb talks about is the velocity is so important with the 300 blackout and also the 556 five, rounds. Like, so if I'm rocking, if my shit hits the fan rifle is a 13.9 inch with the suppressor on it, what would be one and eight twist, two, two, three wild or wildy, depending on how you pronounce it? Uh, what would be your suggestion then for that type of loadout as far as ammunition? Based Load off of Hornady. VMAX, really? Uh, yeah, and here's the reason. You're not going to get any armor penetration. And I say that it may go through two huge phone books, but like it's really going to be really close to stopping it. I did a video where I did three huge um, old operation or uh, old engine manuals uh, from the 80s. Uh, the bookstore had them. I'm like, she's like, yeah, you can have those for a dollar a piece. Go, you know what I'm going to do with them? And so I did a video with pistol armor and three books in a backpack, and it stopped 223 cold in the second book wow um from a 16 inch barrel um and so it and only the um excuse me it stopped the vmax in the second book it stopped the ttsx in the in the third book and the armor the pistol rated 3a panel stopped the m855 ball and the 223 full metal jacket so like the book slowed them down that much uh, so like there's things people can hide behind a lot. And so I think in a 13, I would want to be loaded up with VMAX all the way. And the reason why I'm not saying TTSX or TSX are a better bullet than VMAX is because those bullets require speed to open up. So if I had a 13.7, you know, if all you have is a body shot on body armor, you take it because you want them to feel the impact, right? Right. But I'm aiming hips and shoulders and stuff like that. Gotcha. Um, because I would much rather have that impact. And I have shot many deer through the neck with 55 grain VMAX from a 20 inch barrel. They do the same thing as if you shoot them with a 308 or a 300 wind mag through the neck. You know, really? Bam. They drop okay. right there. They might twitch more afterwards, mm -hmm. but uh, they drop, bam, they're on the ground. Interesting. Neck. That, might, so, that might change it up because I do have an 18 inch. I have an 18 inch. Uh, I have an 18 inch. Uh, I have a 13.9, a 16 inch, and then an 18 inch. And the 18 inch has got a like three inch SJC Titan comp on the end of it. So essentially, the the and it's pin and welded. So essentially, it's like 21 inches long the right. barrel. So that would probably be able to utilize those SS 109s, the Australian Defense. It would be okay. Right. Everything. Interesting. Uh, so um, not as much as you would with the suppressor. Um, so, but like you can actually add some back pressure to the system. Uh, flash hiders can do the same thing. But I would want I would want a 20 inch with a Vortex flash hider on it. Um, for precision shooting, um, that kind of thing. Uh, and if I'm going 62 grain, uh, and most of mine are PMC 62 grain. That's why I can get up here. And uh, I know in every rifle, I have it written down. I know where it hits compared to the TSX 62 grain I'm sighted in with. But like I said, I'm getting away. I'm using the, the TSX because I don't have anything less than a 16 right. inch barrel. 16 what are, inch so barrel. What, what are your thoughts then though on... If you have a shorter barrel, having a faster twist rate, which forces more powder burn. Or do you think that's a feasible thing, or is that kind of just it, an old wives' tale? It does happen, because any time you increase pressure on the round, right. you burn more powder. But you're not. it's not going to be enough to make a difference. Okay. Like, okay, your, your, your 10 and a half inch pistol, instead of getting 2,500, is now getting 2,575. Whoop-de-doo, right? Right. You know, like, it's going to be like that. And, like, yeah, it's going to... It's going to give you an extra 75 feet per second, but it's going to be, you know, all like that. As far as, like, running 5.56, five, like, you should have a 20-inch battle rifle. I don't care if it's an old school, made to look, you know, you should have a 1 in 7, 20-inch barrel. Um, wow. A 1 in yeah. 7, that's a fast twist rate. Yeah, uh, and that's the standard twist rate these days. Too. Yeah, that's true. And, um, uh, and the reason is, is because, you know, you can... You can shoot anything through a one and seven. People think, oh, I can't shoot a 40 grain VMAX through it. Yeah, you can. All right. The jackets are better. It used to be in the old days, if you had a fast twist rate and you had a varmint bullet like a VMAX, that the varmint bullet might shatter coming out because it's been squeezed so much. But now the jackets are made out of better material and they're a little bit thicker. And you have a VMAX coming out. You know, you can shoot a 40 grain VMAX at 3,700 feet per second if you want. Let me, let me, let me uh, ask so. you this. Have you shot any Mead Industries ammo? I have not. So I don't. I'm not able to get a lot of ammo over here. This is one thing. Um, uh, so I can only get what's on the shelf here uh, or what I reload um, because uh, you have to have ammo imported and exported out of Alaska. So I can't order anything online without it getting shipped to a freight forwarder who imports it out of the exports it out of the 
uh, lower 48 and imports it into Alaska. So I, I, I would have to pay two shipping fees to get it here. Um, uh, so I don't order any ammo online. Now I'm about to try to, to try to do this with right. uh, Palmetto States AAC because I want to test it and make videos out of it and you know show people that it's good. And then when I share my affiliate links, I can be like, hey, this is good ammo. Look at this. You know, I want to be able to do that. Uh, and so I'm going to have to talk to Katie and Josiah over at uh, Palmetto State. Okay. Be like, hey, hey, how can we get this here? Because if I go to a website, I, most websites won't even, once I put in my address as Alaska, no longer ship. Like uh, if I'm ordering ammo on the website and I, I scroll down, I, I can't put in my state. Right. You know, yeah. So I've, I've, twice, the so. reason why I bring it up is they make a phenomenal 77 grain uh, performance mm-hmm. boat tail hollow point that can be used for hunting, like for deer and right. stuff like that. Um, but it's a phenomenal and, and it, it out of my 18 inch barrel, AR, I've shot five shot groups that were 0.4 MOA, which oh, yeah, is in, yeah. insane, you know, with, with an AR-15, that's pretty, pretty awesome. And that, if that's what you're getting, that's what you should be shooting. Okay. Like, like that's, that should be your stocked up SHTF ammo. Because okay. Because that's what your gun shoots the best. Right, right. Um, so but if well, you then, had several different loads that shot all the same, or right. close to the same, one's a point six, one's a point three, one's well, a point four. I guess, I guess then in, you make a difference. Right. Then so I guess I guess what I'm I'm getting at with this in a roundabout way is if an if you have an SHTF build, right? What mm-hmm. is in because what I'm hearing from you is is if if this just lead core copper jacketed or copper mm-hmm. bonded, you know, bullet that's right. 77 grains. Um, is shooting the best out of my 18 inch barrel. That's what I should be stocking up for with my SHTF. What, where, where then? Because I, this is, this is something that I fall into a pit trap of feeling like, oh, I need to make sure that the ammo that I have is armor piercing. Where, where then? Because you do ballistic testing. Where's right. your mindset on that? So my mindset is that I have tested a bunch of ceramic body armor now. I've tested Spartan Armors, uh, uh, Hercules, Spartan Armors, Ares that they used to do, and it's now called the Hercules X. Uh, it's like a twelve or $1,300 set of ammo. Uh, the Tacticon Armament, is, they call it a $600 plate. They have a lot of good sales where you can get it a lot, lot cheaper. I've tested the RMA plate that they uh, – I tested that with a 7-millimeter rim mag and an all-copper t- Fort Scott 2E bullet at 3570 feet per second or something – you know, outrageous, you know, uh, I've tested all of these and you're not going through level four armor. So in my opinion is you want, you want to know where the full metal jackets hit out mm-hmm. the reasonable ranges. So, cause you're going to find a lot of it. You want to know where SS 109, 62 grain hits. You want to know where M855 grain hits. You might even want to know where 223 full metal jacket. That's not military rated hits. Cause if it's in 223, it's not getting, it's not getting, yeah, like Fioki, Fioki or range Red, dynamics, Remington or uh, PMC Bronze. This is a 308 Winchester box, but PMC Bronze, they're not going to get the same speed because they're right. not loaded into 556. Five, they're loaded into 223. 223 is tested in 24 inch bolt actions. So that's how they get the speed for 223. 556 five, is tested in a 20 inch AR 15. Right, right. That makes sense. So um, you want to know where all of those hit for SHTF. Okay. And you want to make a chart of it for every rifle you have. Okay. But you want to shoot what is the most accurate in your rifle. And the reason is because you won't go through body armor. Uh, if somebody puts some steel on their car, you know, and they've got it armored up like that killdozer, uh, maybe the 22-250 goes through. Maybe it doesn't. Right. Okay? Um, loaded up with those same bullets. Um, depends on the thickness of the steel and how hard it is, right? But you're, you're probably not going with it, going through it with 223. So my thing, my, the way I'm thinking is, you know, head, hips, uh, shoulders, arms, legs, you know, get them out of the fight and dealing with a wound. Right. And cause you know, a center mass hit, um, you know, I'm only going to put you down with a center mass hit, but like I said, it is possible with a good trauma pad to survive a center mass hit from a 300 wind mag. Do I right. think it's going to happen? Do I think you're going to have bruised and crushed organs and ribs? And do I think you're going to live? No. But is it possible? Yes. All right. And so, like, that what, guy what might about get, what about then? Up, you know? What about then? If you're, if let's say, okay, my my SHTF ban, my you know fantasy or whatever it is, if we have to evacuate Colorado because Colorado becomes a heavily contested state and we need to get the get out of here, right? But there's yeah. a chance that we're going to run into some shit. 
And my wife, mm-hmm. let's say each one of us is carrying a sidearm on our hip, and then we're each mm-hmm. carrying two rifles, right? Um, right? And so let's say she's carrying the 22 rifle in a backpack, and then she's got an AR-15 slung across her chest. I've got an AR-15 slung across my chest. What about getting something like a Desert Tech HTI to throw in my backpack in a, in a 50, 50 BMG situation? Or is that just going to be, is that excessive? Is there a better cartridge for if you need, if you need to take out something that's armor, armor protected um, and stuff like that, what's, what's the good way to go? 50 BMG is your only, only choice as a civilian. Um, I've, I'm a, I'm a thinking there would be stuff laying around on the ground. There is a slight chance you could get 338 Lapua armor piercing, um, but I just, I, it's, that's very slight. Um, 50 BMG, like people that own 50 BMG have those rounds. All right, they like you can find those rounds at like military surplus stores and stuff. At least you could a while back. I don't think you can anymore. Right. Um. So like, uh, but even a 50 BMG full metal jacket against AR 500 steel. If you're at any distance, it's not going through. Really? You know? Okay. Um, yeah, like j- just a full metal jacket, not an armor piercing one. Like oh, an armor piercing one, it's making a dent. Like there's there's videos out there. Uh, it'll make a dent on the plate at a thousand yards, but it's not going through it unless you have armor piercing bullets. Uh-huh. So like, um, my thing is is like, you're better off carrying more food. You're better okay. off carrying a way to get food. Like right. you have to hole up somewhere for three or four months because someone's injured. You're better off bringing seeds with you. That's okay? that's so that's like, that's like, honestly that's, been the thing for us is we're going to each have a sidearm, right? We're going right. to each have an AR-15, and then we're right. going to be bringing the bolt action 22 and the and the pistol 22 and the suppressors. That's right. That's honestly what we've thought about doing. Um, right. You know, and then bringing water filtration devices. And water. Yeah. Yeah. Water filtration, as much food as you can pack. Um, I, uh, but I, I, again, you need to know your bug out location and work on living there. Like, mm. uh, and, and, you know, like the way the world is right now, shit hits the fan could happen tomorrow. But Thanks. like, uh, SHGF, but assume you got a year to six months, six months to a year, you need to make a plan to live in your bug out location. I, I can't emphasize that enough because then all your rifles are accessible. Then so all your what, and when you say so, live there, it's not, but it's not leave my current establishment and then get there to live. You're talking about actually transition my homestead from my, my suburban house right. outside of the city into a rural protected environment that I would be able to, have less involvement with people, raiders, or whatever we want to call them. Because that's that's what's going to happen is there's going to be raiders. Is, is... There, there will be. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I live in my bug out location, okay? Uh, and I'm fortunate. We, when we went to buy a house, we had a very limited budget. Um, and uh, Anchorage is very expensive, okay? Uh, what would be a, a $300,000 house there is a $700,000 house here. And uh, we had choices. We could get a fixer-upper in Anchorage be close to work but then the hoa fees so we if we got a place with no hoa fees or very low hoa fees we were in a crime neighborhood right um and and there's a reason why we call it lost anchorage by the way um is needles and drugs and homelessness really like that. yep sounds yep. like it, colorado it, springs man yeah yeah i'm telling you it's just like it we legalized marijuana too and that's what happened um but anyway all that aside okay um or we could drive to the city back and forth every day. Either one was going to cost us a lot of money. Fixer upper costs a lot of money. HOA fees cost a lot of money. Driving costs a lot of money in gas. But when I found this house online, I said, I bet that's in that neighborhood. And that neighborhood is a protected neighborhood with a mountain there, a single two lane highway, a trout stream, or excuse me, a salmon stream across the, the highway that you can fish and like it's got all these things i bet it's in that neighborhood right there when i saw it online we went to visit that 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 night when i saw it we made an offer the next day and so now like i commute 35 minutes back and forth to los anchorage but like my bug out bad is, is, is a get home back okay what do i need to get home right Snow shoes uh so that's socks, it's, it's interesting it's interesting food. that you bring that up because i know john lovell talked about he ditched the bug out bag because instead he said he wanted to work with his local community so people would come to him and they would they would have 
their community there. You exactly. Know? Exactly. And, and like I've met John Lovell. How was that he? Is, is he nice? Uh, yeah, he's he's nice. Uh, he didn't have a lot of time when we were talking, um, but um, uh, and we were talking mostly about homeschooling and homeschooling your kids. And uh, I'm a school teacher, mm-hmm. so I have a di- different opinion on that than he does. But uh, um, my opinion is gradually changing to what homeschoolers sh- like. Like that's another that's a whole right. other broadcast. That's a whole other topic for another thing day. I would love to um, talk to you about that because my wife and I yeah. we want to we want to homeschool our kids if yeah. we if we stay in Colorado. Even though, like, in our neighborhood, like I told you, we have a great neighborhood. We actually have our own elementary school and middle school in our neighborhood. That's like Walden, right? Right. And it's gifted magnet school. But it's part of the Colorado curriculum. And so right. we're, we're, we're nervous about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would love to so, pick your brain. We can do that offline. Um, yeah, but uh, some other time. But, yeah, like, like, I would like to come back on and talk about why I'm a public school teacher talking uh like maybe you should homeschool your kids i would like to to talk about that uh later um at another that's another episode uh, right <laughs> uh that's a whole nother episode that we could have um and i would love to pick uh to to have my brain picked on that and uh, tell you what i'm doing what i'm saying is transition into to to living where you're gonna bug out bug out where you're gonna live um and like if you have a cabin you're gonna go to transition as much stuff to that cabin when it looks like shtf is going to happen check your kids out of school and go to the cabin for the weekend if it doesn't happen you can come back you know right what I mean? that's a good point like, yeah there's a there's a uh there's a lot of things like you know if they miss a half an afternoon of school every three weeks right come out on a friday who cares if you're right. alive right um so like there there's that so like my whole thing about bugging out especially here in alaska um, is like live where you're going to bug out. Cause right. like, there's no way I'm walking 20 miles through the Alaska wilderness to right. find a cabin somewhere. Like there's no way I'm putting on a bug out bag and running from the Russians. Right. Why would I do, why would I do that when I could blow up the bridge to my house and, you know, take pot shots at them from where I live? You know, right. like, That's like, a good like, point. That's you know, a good why point. would I, why would I, you know, risk running all the way to Canada on an open road with airstrikes above me? when I could live where I'm at, you know, in a, with a basement and in a protected area, you know, that it just bugging out, it makes no sense. Right. Now, bugging, if you live in a major city, an urban you, environment, an yeah. urban environment, you got to get out of that during SHGM. That I agree with. You have a bug out bag, you have a bug out container in your car with more food, more, right. ammo, more toiletries, more um, things like that. Um, but like getting, like getting out of the city is one thing, but Live in as much as you can make it possible. Live in your bug out area. And right. if that means if that means, hey, your bug out is your friend's house. It's four hours out of the city and they know you're coming. If they are in the same mindset as you. Well, hey, can I store a few guns at your place? Um, you know, I'll even transfer them to you legally if I right. have to by the law. You know, and he's like, you'll give them to me. Yeah. Yeah, as long as you, as long as you, may, me and you sign a, a personal contract and say yeah. this is why I'm giving them to you, and me and you keep copies of the personal contract, yeah. an unofficial but, uh, trust, like, like an unofficial right. trust, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, well, that's why, that's why, like my my SHTF is a thirteen point nine with a quick detach suppressor, and I put a law tactical folder on it because I can take my com- yeah. my computer bag. Right. I got a computer mm-hmm. backpack. I could fold up my rifle, take the suppressor off, put it in that computer bag and close it and put my backpack right. on me. And you would have no clue that I have an AR-15 in there with six extra mats and a right. suppressor. Right. Um, I highly recommend for a bug out bag, though, an herbal stock hunting pack, uh, especially one that's molly webbed. OK. And the, will the you reason- email me? Will you email a good one? Yeah, and the reason why is a hunting an herbal sock. They have that scabbard for a rifle back here. Oh, it's like Eberly herbally sock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I have one. Yeah. I have one of those, but it's it's the yeah. Rocky Mountain Elk Edition, and it's and it's, I like that one. That's a good hunting pack. Yeah. Um, they have a gunslinger, gunslinger two, and a fifty BMG pack, and they have all these that were designed to carry the fifty BMG rifle, uh, up the hills of Afghanistan. That's what they designed it for. Mm-hmm. And they they're molly webbed. You can get them in multi cam and all this kind of stuff. And they are uh, great, and I recommend them. I use them exclusively as a hunting pack. I have some others that I don't like. I have a mm-hmm. brain pack and stuff like that. I'd much rather 
carry my er- Everly stock. Right. Called er- well, Herbal so stock so the problem yeah. the problem that I have with like so, and that's what I said why I'd like to make a podcast with people around the country, around the right. globe that are in different environments different situations i'd even like to get other people that are in different countries to have a conversation with about like hey what do you do if we had a script kind of like dungeons and dragons right and instead of having different characters you 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 have a different family environment you live in a different environment maybe with different laws what do you what are you going to do and then read the script all right russia does x and this causes this to happen mass panic breaks out because I can't if mass panic broke out in Colorado and I threw on my Eberly Rocky Mountain hunting or Rocky Mountain elk foundation with the gunslinger uh, on uh-huh. there and I was walking through Colorado Springs, I would get picked off. Right. Oh, oh sure. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, the other thing is, is like if you're bugging out, you go as far as you can in a vehicle like that's that that's a no brainer. But like, again, right. You know, if you're having to bug out, you're in the wrong place to begin with. So, right. Like, also, yeah, we, we have can't. a couple of people talking right now on the on the chat. Joshua Grantland, Everly, yeah. uh, uh, Herbally stocks are great. I have one with the gun boot built in and a hard. And yep, that's a great one. Uh, in yep. Montana, I'm using Outdoor Channel. I definitely have worked out a plan to defend my home and family between cartel drug activity and the other idiots. You don't have. Yeah, don't have your head in the sand. I actually, so I posted a short. I do a lot of those nine four five industry shorts, and I yeah. had some guy here in Colorado Springs uh, tell me that I needed my pistol because the Swernio S U R E N O S Swernios. Mm-hmm. Um, essentially, right. it's Mexican cartel gang that lives in the United States and is popular in the Mexican uh, population in U.S. prisons or in gang life mm-hmm. outside of prisons. He threatened me. Telling me that I needed my pistol because the Swernios are going to run up on me and take my shit in Colorado Springs. Yeah, it's it's a real possibility, and um, we have uh, we have cartels here, and the cartels actually have people in the native villages. Um, that's why there's so much drug use and in the native villages. Right, it, you're not allowed to bring alcohol into the native villages. They're, the ones that are on the highway station, if you pull in, there's a guard shack there, and they, they will check your ve- their vehicle because I mean. It's their country, technically. They don't have to have a search warrant to check your vehicle, right? Right. Um, so there is that. So, But I, I can't emphasize enough. If, if there's anything at SHTF that you're learning from me, okay, know your situation and prepare for your worst situation. For us, that's nuclear. That's a nuclear bomb. Ha- right. J-Bear. Right. J-Bear, right? Joint base Elmendorf Richardson, J-Bear, right? That, that's the worst situation I'm going to be in, okay? Uh, a... a um, uh, an economic collapse is not as bad as that, uh, though it may be more permanent. A um, you know a uh, grid down uh, EMP is not as bad as that uh, for me, though it may be more permanent. And if that happens, my grid is down. So anything I prefer prepare my grid down for, uh, I, I'm also preparing for that. So it, it, know that your most likely situation in your area, like you that gang in your area or that kind of thing. Know that, okay, and then live in your bug out area now mm-hmm. here's the thing like where you're living is not necessarily a bad bug out area because you can farm most of the year in your yards you right. can literally dig up your yards for crops you could literally um if you installed wooden burning stoves and you have a a gated ar- uh, community with a wall you know you're not in a bad area you just have to get everybody on the same page right right and, and that's right. the hard part for you so like i wouldn't se- necessarily say like i would it I wouldn't say you need to go buy a cabin, okay? I would say you need to turn where you're living into your bug out area, so you don't have to bug out. Right. Um, so like, I would tu- I would turn like I would I would build I would find like minded people in the community, and you know even if it's only ten percent of the houses, you guys got a group and a plan. And right. When stuff happens. You proceed. Hey, we've already got a group and a plan. You're joining us or you're leaving. You know, right. one of the two. That's um, that's kind of what I was so. I was talking to a guy the other day. He's like former special forces dude and whatnot. And he said realistically, he's he works up at my range, uh, my shooting uh-huh. range. And we were talking about it. He said realistically, the ideal situation is if you and your neighbors can hunker down for thirty days, create a sense of community for at least a month, and don't leave. And, and have people on, you know, rotating shifts of, of sentinel duty, making sure nobody's coming in or around your area. 
that that is going to play out the best because the first 30 days is going to be, and this is from like his military training. The first 30 days is going to be the worst for society. And that's yep. when the most shit's going to go down. And he's like, if yep. you can move the least and stay put and be able to be secured in your little area with a sense of community and protect one another, he goes, after that 30 days, it's it, it'll thin out and people, a lot of people will have killed off each other or left the area and it'll be a lot easier for you to move. Right, yeah. No, no, and that's what I'm saying. Live in your bug out area. Right. Hunker down there. So d- don't think about necessarily going and buying a cabin, though if you have the financial and resources to do that, certainly do it. But like make your, where you live now defendable. Okay. Mm-hmm. Pull out the... Pull out the walls and put some AR-500 steel in the walls. Between the wood and the siding and the, the AR-500 steel, it's going to stop most threats. Right. For me, that's a redneck with a reloading bench, you know? <laughs> um, but, like, um, it's going to stop all 9 millimeter, all 10 millimeter, all uh, most 30-odd-6, most 308, most 556. Five, you know, so, like, put... Put that under your windows if you need to. Like, do something to hunker down in your area. Right. Um, and so, me, you know, I have a... I have a, a bathroom window that's in the middle of the house. If I need to shoot out of my house, I can fill the bathtub up with water because it's a sit-in bathtub. And now I now between the wood and the water in the bathtub, if they try to shoot through my house to get to me, oh I'm yeah, just bullets stop. don't do well in water. In water, yeah, it's gonna yeah. stop. It's gonna stop. Now it's only gonna last about ten shots, but it's gonna stop. You know, yeah, right? Right. Um, and uh, so there. there well, that's that why you gotta get the so. flex seal. That's right. Smack. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah. All right, yeah, man. That. So yeah, so, so Montana Music said what I was talking about is called circling the wagons. So absolutely, yeah. that it, it is circling the wagons, and I think that that's a big thing. Even if you're in a rural environment too, because uh, when when we lived in New Hampshire, our next door neighbor Randy was former special forces during Vietnam. He was he right. did like helicopter, a whole bunch of weird stuff, but he had his class three license, and he sold to the New Hampshire. Um, SWAT teams, like the local municipality SWAT teams and the state troopers, and he sold machine guns, he sold uh, saws, he, he, he sold everything, fully auto 12 gauges, and he was right. a crazy guy, but his big thing was, he wasn't a nice man, but he was mm-hmm. pleasant enough, but he made sure he went around to everybody's house every couple of months just to check up on everybody, hey, have you guys gotten any new cars? What's going on? Who's living here? And just because he wanted to have good situational awareness, um, because we Uh lived in like a little, wasn't suburban. Each house was on like five to seven acres, but we Uh had neighbors, but it was like a one way in, one way out type of uh, of neighborhood out in the middle of the the woods in New Hampshire. But he wanted to know, like if something went down, if all of a sudden there's this black pickup truck driving up that he's never seen before, he doesn't want to start shooting at it. And it turns out that it's Earl you know, three houses down that just got a new right. Silverado three weeks ago, you know? Right. I get it. So, all right. Um, all right. Well, you want to wrap up the live portion? Yeah. I want to wrap up all the right. live portion. I've got to get going. Yeah. Now. Yeah. No, I got you. All right. Yeah. Well, let's do this for the live portion. Then let's uh, go ahead and let the viewers and the listeners know for the live portion, what you got coming down the pipeline, anything exciting, what they should be looking into. And then we'll roll into the yep. recorded portion. Cool. So um, again, my Alaskan ballistics on YouTube and, uh, some exciting things I've got going is I'm uh, reviewing the H- JTS 12 gauge shotgun. I've got the Strybog versus the CMMG Banshee coming up, along with Chooks Outdoor Adventures. That's going to be released Saturday. Um, I've got a Y, I think 308 is better than 65 Creedmoor coming up. I've got a best defensive pistol in ballistics gel coming up. I've got a, like I test like eight different kinds of nine millimeter ammo in ballistics gel and the jeans and stuff like that uh with a glock 43x you'll be happy um and then uh yeah i uh um i've got a lot of things coming up i got uh north fork bullets in 308 winchester uh they're out of sweden and they sent me a bunch of bullets to test and i i really think it's a good hunting bullet so uh i got that coming up so i got a lot of stuff coming up and um uh yeah uh that's that's what i'm coming up with so far so i got a few other big things that i'm working on but yeah all right, man. That's where we're at. That's awesome. You got a lot of stuff coming down the pipeline. I mean, as, yep. a, as a content creator at your size, you're really pushing forward right now to get to that over that, yeah. you know, glass ceiling type thing. But yeah, yeah, all right. To everybody, we're going to keep recording and we're going to get into the show and tell portion, maybe touch on some more sensitive topics that we can't talk about mm-hmm. during the live stream. And then right. if you uh, subscribe to my All Are Welcome podcast channel, 
Um, I will share that link with you after I post the edited podcast for this. Uh, you'll be able to find the rest of the content that is not going to be on YouTube or during the live stream. So thank you, everybody, for stopping by. We're going to keep rolling into the recorded portion. And okay. Oh, sure, so, right. Yeah. So, um, so hey, I told you uh, I've only shot a grizzly bear through the head with one pistol, and that was this one. <laughs> Holy crap! So, Holy crap! So this is a gl Glock 21. Okay. And, um, it's got a uh, a fully supported lone wolf barrel in it. Back when lone wolf actually made good barrels, and um, it is uh, got a heavier spring in it and heavier magazine springs, so I can run 45 super. Now 45 super looks like 45 ACP, but the case walls are thicker. Okay. So that's a 200 grain semi wide cutter hard cast. That's a hard cast, yeah. It's going about 1370 out of this barrel, 1350 to 1370. That's a 6.61 inch barrel, and um, so I'd shot this grizzly bear with a 338 Winchester Magnum, 250 grain. I was on a downward slope, and I didn't aim. I was aiming right here. Didn't think of my drop in the downward slope correctly. I shot him right through the throat, and he went flat. Okay. And I knew he wasn't a huge one, but he was smaller when I got up to him. But he was doing this reflex breathing thing. When I, when I walked up to him, he was going, Whoa. Whoa. Oh, wow. Whoa. <laughs> and you're hunting by, by yourself with the grizzly bear right, yeah. uh, on the ground. And I'm like, no. So I had four guns on me. I had it under my pack that was on me. I had my 44 Magnum two and a half inch. This was on my chest. And out on the outer part of my pack, I had my Glock 19 with hollow points. For, but I didn't want to leave it in my car because it's the road. It was starting to open up and it's a tourist destination. You know what I mean? Um, it's the Denali Highway. Um, and so you'll see a lot of people on it. But I didn't see a lot of people because it was early spring mm -hmm. and it was just starting to melt. And so I, I grabbed the Glock 19. I put two through the top of his head. 124 grain plus P spear gold dot. I, when I skinned the head, I found one under the skin and one on top of the brain. That's how tough the skin is. Spear gold dot, 124 grain. Not a big grizzly bear. Not a big one. This is how tough they are. The, all the muscle around the head and all the sinew. One I found on top of the, under the skin, on top of the skull. One had gone through the brain cranium and I found it on top of the brain. That's nuts. Yeah, so then I shot it with hard cast out of this, and it stopped twitching. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. So that is why I say hard cast in the woods. Yeah. yeah. You know, hollow points for the hood. Right. Hard cast for the woods. You, know? <laughs> and I, you need that on a shirt. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I, uh, that would make a great shirt. That would uh, make a great shirt. I, I, um, I, uh, uh, I, uh, gosh, I, I, now I got to go on Teespring and make that shirt. Thanks. Um, <laughs> I want it. I want a shirt. If you make a shirt, uh, I want one. I want to be okay. able to order one. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll email you a link or whatever. Um, but yeah. Um, so I normally carry 10 millimeter instead of 45 super now. Cause it's not 45 <coughs> super. It's not a hundred percent reliable. It's like 99.5. I took somebody to the range the other day. They didn't have as tight a grip on it as they wanted. And a round didn't go all the way into battery. So I'm like, I'm thinking about getting rid of this now i have that tight grip on it and i know right. how not the limp wrist and you know it doesn't take but like a two percent with 45 super limp wrist for it not to oh wow it. like, gotcha like, yeah it, it's right. like if i just handed it to you and you just casually shot what it about, like this what about what about what about what about then why not do something like a 357 with an eight round cylinder um because it's an eight round cylinder and not a 15 round cylinder um <laughs> so i mean so a glock 20 uh, th this is i don't have um hold on a second yeah i do ha hold on one second now i got a different barrel in it for testing right uh, i normally only have a six and a half inch kkm barrel this is the nine inch lone wolf barrel damn this is this is the model 40 the biggest glock um and this is in ten, <laughs> this is in 10 millimeter right oh god and, uh, and uh so normally i have the six and a half inch barrel for for hunting in there or for carrying it in there uh sometimes i put the original glock barrel in for tests but i usually only only really use it you get 15 rounds in a glock 10 millimeter and they're essentially the same power and a little bit better penetration most of the time in a hard cast than uh 357 magnum really and um yeah um so magnum might get 100 foot pounds more in a six inch barrel or an eight inch barrel but it's not, uh, you know, if you have a four and a half inch 357 Magnum, the, you know, the, the revolver powders are slightly slower burning than most pistol powders. So you're not, you're, you're really truncating it if you truncate the barrel and you'll get more penetration 
Uh, and I've got several 10 millimeter versus 357 Magnum videos on there. And also, uh, like Underwood test all their 357 Magnum in an eight inch barrel. Mm. Um, so if you have a six inch barrel, you're not getting the velocities they say they do. Um, and uh, a lot of them are only for a, a, a uh, so if you're going to go a, a revolver, why would you sacrifice power and not get a 44 or 454? Or my, my, so my, like, so. yeah, we've talked about it before, but my bear gun. So if I'm in Colorado, I, I'll carry like either my 357 with hard cast or I'll get 40 Smith and Wesson. Cause I got a mm. nice chest holster for um, yeah. um, a, I've got an HKP 30 and it holds 13 plus one. And I'm not too worried about the black bear out here uh, versus the Brown bear. But if I go into Wyoming, Idaho or Montana and I'm tent camping, I carry my Smith and Wesson model 29, 44 yeah. Magnum. Yeah. My six twenty nine five inch classic is what I carry most of the time. I didn't, I didn't bring it down here to the basement to show everybody. So uh, there is that, but um, my wife has appropriated the, the, um, the model 40 10 millimeter really this is what she, she likes to carry now again it's the six and a half inch barrel and again it's not you know it's um right. um it's 15 rounds she can shoot it more accurately right like everybody goes get your wife the small one the glock 29 well she can't shoot it accurately because it's and i've pretty much appropriated this one as my nightstand right. gun she's appropriated so this one as let, me, let me let me let me let me ask you this then so your two bear defense guns don't have optics on it but your home defense does why doesn't your bear defense guns have optics batteries run out that's, okay. and that's essentially um like okay if i'm against a human being in the middle of the night i've got a flashlight i can f front sight post right. over the flashlight right okay my bear defense doesn't have optics uh one thing is is like i have a hard time drawing and finding the dot i'm training myself on that i just got this sealy to optic to review and it's a good optic all right um so that's their uh bull optic yeah, it's yeah. huge huge it, it's bull gigantic optic. yeah yeah, and uh, and I love it. It's a great optic. I've never had a bad thing from them, um, and they've sent three optics out now. And I, and I actually had one on the on the forty four Magnum for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the, that's their uh, bear. And I've had it on the AR ten. I've had it on <laughs> a bunch of the. Uh, I've had it on the uh, ten millimeter Banshee at first too. And it's it's a good good optic. But my my bear defense guns don't have optics. Um, one, my, uh, so my Glock 21 here does, it's, you know, old gen three. So it's not, you know, I'm not going to go pay for that to get cut yeah, out. Yeah, get milled. Yeah. I'm not going to pay hundreds of dollars for something that doesn't need to happen. Right. Uh, and then, um, while the, the, the gen four forty here is an MOS, it's not a very, um, my wife doesn't go practice enough with this two small kids to get used to a red dot. Gotcha. Why am I going to? Why am I right. going to throw something in there that's actually right. going to make it harder, not easier, because she doesn't practice enough with that, with the red dot. Right. You know, and that's my fault. I need to babysit the kids more while she goes and practice. Okay? Yeah. And we've been talking about that. So it's totally my fault. Um, and then uh, I have a high-vis red dot on the – or red front side post on the 629 Smith. So why am I like – and I can just – I already know when it – when that – when that – Sight post goes down, fire again. Right. Boom, 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 boom. And I'm going to keep them like this on a target at seven to ten yards. Right. Like, and it's going to be in a, easily within the kill zone of a grizzly bear head. Yeah. I'd right? say, so, um, crazy. So. The, that, the 29 is one of my, I, so I have the dirty, hairy version. So I have the blue, right. the really pretty blue, six, yeah. six and three quarter inch barrel. Um, right. And it go. had the wood grip, but I, I took that wood grip off and I put an aftermarket target grip on it that, really allows you to get a nice grip with your dominant hand but with your your support hand it actually has an extra groove for your pinky and dude yeah nice. when i shoot that thing now there's it's so tame for me uh you know not to toot my own horn with it but i was out in the mountains with a buddy who got an ar-15 and he got a uh, red dot to put on it and and he had had iron so we were out in the mountains are like all right let's go to 50 yards you know we got it dialed in at 50 it's like all right let's go to 100 yards and we had a target, like a wooden target stand with a target on it. And uh -huh. um, he was sighting it in. I go, I bet you I could hit that target with my my 44 Magnum. And I don't have optics on it. He was like, there's no right. way. And I shot. I didn't actually hit the paper, but I hit the wooden frame, and I blew a huge chunk out of it. And at yeah. 100 yards, I was like, hot dog. I felt like Jerry mitchell -like for a second. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, but anyway, like, uh, so my primary um – like one of my SHTF guns is this one. Vergara? 
Bergara HMR. I've got eight different loads that it can take and shoot half inch groups with, uh, both factory and hand loads, about four each. Uh, Amen 2 has a new 12 round magazine out. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so I got two extra rounds. I got a bunch of the 10 round mag pools. You can just see how smooth this bolt is. Oh, yeah. You can, I, you can see it through the thing. And the trigger is about two pounds. I've never adjusted it from the factory. Really? Yep. And it is so. What is that chambered in? This is a 6.5 Creedmoor. Okay. And but you so, said you're getting rid of it, though, because you're switching over to a 308. Uh, I'm not getting rid of this at all. No, okay. it's too, I don't get rid of accurate guns. Okay. I get rid of inaccurate guns. Um, but like, yeah. So what I'm getting, what I'm doing is switching my AR 10s over to 308. Okay. Uh, Cause I, I still will have an AR 10 upper for six, five Creedmoor. I'll still have the, uh, a, a hunting bolt action. That's my wife's a savage mm -hmm. for six, five Creedmoor. And I'll still have this. And if I'm going where I need to set up on the power line to walk right. above our house or something, I'm going to have this with me. I want to I want to I want to ask you a question. You don't have to answer, yeah. uh, but mm -hmm. you mentioned you had your hunting rifle, and when you shot the bear, your friend's kid had knocked your rifle over, and you said mm -hmm. you no longer use that scope or those rings. Will you share the brand of the scope and the ring so people know to maybe steer clear? Uh, you don't have to, but I'm just asking. It, the scope was a Nikon, and I've never had issues with that actual scope. I've, I've put it on other things since. Okay. The scope was a Nikon. Um, the rings were, I forgot what they were called. They were, um, it, it was a $65 one-piece base in a, a ring set that people at Bass Pro swore, hey, this works. And uh, no, it doesn't. So I go to, I'll tell you what I, I'll tell you the opposite. On everything I have, I have one of three things. I have a Louisville backcountry cross slot on just about everything I have. It's about a nine, like it's a 50 to $70. Uh, uh, it's aluminum, but it's good aluminum. There are some aluminum ones out there. You can flex and bend. Don't get those. Um, and, but I would, I would put, uh, that's, that's what's on here is a, um, this, this cross right here. This, uh -huh. one, yep. this one, this one came with a tally, uh, 20 MOA. And I put this zero MOA, um, on here. And the reason why I put zero MOA is because there was no place in the Nikon app. This is a Nikon scope. Uh, there's no place in the Nikon app to account for the drop when you put a different MOA oh, on here. Okay. So I was like, I'll put a flat one on, on there and not worry about it. Right. The math's pretty close to the same, but I've had it. I've had it do things before on a 270 that weren't right. So this is my um, hunting. This is going to be my new hunting rifle. Again, cross bolt um, there, and this one I have a Leopold. Uh, backcountry rings on as well okay and the, those have been um wonderful for me um what's so, that chambered in right there 300 winchester magnum oh three wind mag all right so is that gonna yep. be, so you'll still hunt with that six five creed more it's just gonna be smaller animals so i'll hunt caribou with the six five creed more in the winter okay i don't hunt i don't hunt with that rifle in the summer oh really and uh, a couple of reasons one uh i want to be able to carry my rifle a lot in the summer that thing's pretty heavy. It's yeah, I've got, I've got a, yeah. I've got a B14 Wilderness HMR, yeah. and that thing, yeah. it's yeah. so darn heavy. Yeah, and so there, there is that. Like, um, and the, but the Begara B14 is a great precision rifle thing. I have killed a caribou with it in the early November. Walked out on a frozen lake and I shot it at 288 yards, 127 grain LRX. Again, that LRX is the the best hunting bullet. So is that what I, so I haven't found, so with my B14 HMR, dude, I literally just this past week, I took the optic off of it. I got a really nice burst signature series scope on there. Mm -hmm. I took it off and I told my wife, I'm going to put it up on gun broker, but now I'm kind of wondering, should I be trying different ammo in it then? Uh, yeah. What were you trying before? Uh, Hornady ELDX. It just did not, it, it got okay groups. I got around like one MO. Um, yeah, you should be trying different things in it. Yeah. Uh, did you break your barrel in? It's got probably about a hundred no, rounds in it. No, That's no. a no. Did you, did, did you do the shoot clean shoot? Oh clean, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, you did that. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a big deal with Bergara's. Um, and I used to not be a believer in that. Yeah. Uh, I'm a believer in yeah. it now. For I break it every every barrel in I can. I did not actually break this one in though. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I would yeah go buy try different ammo. Go buy a box of everything that you might want to hunt elk with. Right. Them. Well, I so I, I my and elk. The hunting, reason why I, yeah. I, the reason why I said elk is because if you're bugging out and you have to shoot an elk to live right you've got a bullet, bullet that can do it I've, anything yeah so, e eldx is okay right. oh, wow. head up and looking away from you and have a back of brainstem shot mm -hmm. um but with the lrx and it's a 127 grain um you know your your bc goes significantly down 
but it's still a good hunting bullet out to 600 yards or more with out of a full size barrel. So okay. there is that. So that's awesome. So, this is my bug out gun and this is my aero precision build. I know some people hate on aero precision, but it works. Yeah, they do. Got a U.S. optics uh, LPVO on it. Um, the fail zero bolt carrier group, I do not recommend them. I've had so many issues with the bolt carrier group. It ended up being a bad extractor and extractor pin in it. It caused it to be not smooth. It caused it to hang up. It um, it really hated, still hates the 22250 upper I have. And um, yeah, but it's smooth now and it works. And uh, this is, um, you know, I do recommend making sure you get a tapered barrel on these so that they're not too heavy. If you get a heavy barrel, AR-10 is going to be heavy. Like the 6.5 Creedmoor is 18 inches, but a heavy barrel. It's easily a pound or two heavier than this. Damn. Um, How long yeah. is the barrel on that one? 18 inches. Um, okay. And I consider 18 inch kind of your minimum for 308. But you're not, and you're going to lose a lot in a 16 inch barrel, but you're not going to lose near as much energy because of the heavier bullets right. that 308 shoots versus 5.56. You know, 5.56 is going to be in the 29s with a 16 inch barrel instead of the 3150s or the 32s, whatever load you're, but, you know, with 308, you can get that, you can get away with a 13.7 or a you know, a 16 inch barrel or something like that, because you're shooting a 150 grain bullet, you're still, even in a 13, seven, you're going to still generate way over 2000 foot pounds of energy, you know, so you're still going to have that energy right. to put something down in 308. So I am a big fan of the 308 now. Mm -hmm. And, um, I killed my first deer with a 308 as a four, 13 year old in Georgia. And like, uh, like I like 308 ever since, uh, I think it's a great round. And I think that's, that's the way to go for SHTF is kind of a, a 308 AR-10 right. for me. Uh, anywhere you live where stuff can hunt you back, you need to go with a 308, in my opinion. Okay. Um, and plus, technically, 308 is going to reach 1,000 yards. People have done it with iron sights in a 308 before. Mm -hmm. My dad has. Um, you know, so that means you're, you know, you can outshoot people. If they're shooting at you five or 600 yards with a, a 223 and their bullet's just getting – obliterated by the wind and it's landing three feet beside you and stuff like that and they don't know what they're doing right you can technically reach them a lot easier with the 308 right so like right so if you're having to shoot back at people like 308 what, what about what is that company nemo that makes like the 300 wind mag ar-15 yeah, there's, there's there's a few of them and yeah uh it's a proprietary receiver and bolt and everything but you're talking about like a 16 pound gun at that point oh, okay like this, like, or a 12 pound gun right like i'd have to go look them up but like you know, this fully loaded is still less than 11 pounds wow. you know, with, a 20, okay. with a 25 round magazine. And I can hold it with one hand. Um, right. I'm planning on buying a lightweight barrel, 16 inch version and building my wife an upper for our other one. So, but I will show right. you what I got right here. If I'm walking in bear country, this is what I have. It's the Henry X. Okay. And this is in 4570. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. that's pretty. And, yeah. And so Henry X got the XS system sights on it. These are really nice um and it's both tube fed and side gate and it has m lock slots here which i've got a Renite flashlight they sent me to review on um which i like this because now i at night i can use this as an aiming device wherever that barrel is pointing between the two lights yeah <laughs> wherever the shadow is pull the trigger you know right um yeah so, like, dude. you can actually yeah, you can actually kind of use it to aim, like, in a quick situation where a bear is gonna, coming up on you. We had a situation once where we were walking out of a, a duck hunting area on the Kenai Peninsula. We were duck hunting around this lake, and we were walking out. It was dark, and a bear crossed us on the trail, a black bear. Um, and um, Courtney has one. I was carrying a 9 millimeter at the time with hard cast in it because it was the only thing I had a holster for mm. with the light because I knew I was going to be walking out in the dark. I was right. A nine, all I was carrying is a nine millimeter and a 12 gauge. And so now if I go, there's, there's some type of rifle with me. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so, and so bear defense, I also have a 458 SOCOM at AR. Um, it's pretty good. Um, so I do recommend, you know, you know, if you're bugging out in a group, somebody needs to have a hunting rifle. Fast. And the reason, yeah. Yeah. And the reason why is longer range precision, uh, taking game, reaching out farther than you can with your AR 15s. Um, you know, somebody needs to have a hunting rifle. If you're bugging out, bugging out in groups, uh, that kind of thing. If you're like, if you're going out on a squad and you're checking the perimeter or whatever, somebody should have a 30 odd six with the scope and the knowledge to shoot it out to 600 yards. Right. You know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Now, um, something that people will see on the channel here 
This is uh, my upper for the AR-10. I switch it out with the 6.5 Creedmoor up, uh, which I don't have with me. Uh, I don't really switch it out with the uh, thing. This is my 22250, 26-inch uh, barrel. Uh, wow. And this is this is a McGowan uh, lightweight. I, it's really a medium taper, lightweight barrel, McGowan. I, I'm i not getting the accuracy from it. I wish I did. Mm. So, sorry, McGowan barrels, if you're listening, but I'm, I'm just not getting it. Um, but I'm, I'm working on a few things that might tweak it. I'm thinking eventually one of those brakes that you can adjust. I forgot what they're called. Um, oh, tuner? Uh, yeah, the e- the EC tuner brake. EC yeah. tuner, yeah. That might help it because, uh, I mean, it's a lightweight barrel and it's 26 inches. I'm fighting physics on it. So mm-hmm. with barrel whip and that kind of thing. So there's that. Um, so, yeah, my everyday carry. Uh, I had it right here somewhere. I do not know where I – oh, that's right here. Everyday carry is – Generally a Glock 19, although I will switch it out for a Glock 29. Okay. How do you uh, like that Olight? Uh, they work great for me. I've never had a problem with them. Uh, one came loose from the, the, the like the two parts of it came loose between the mountain stuff here. I just glued it back. But uh, um, yeah, I've never had an issue with Olights. Uh, okay. Other than that one that came loose and I just, you know, it's like anything else. This is a Black Rhino concealment. Nice. Holster they make. They make a lot of good holsters for the O lights, and they did not. I bought all these. They did not pay me to to say say that. So um, there is that. So again, we talked earlier about the Strybog. I happen to have it right here. Woo! So uh, and I am a member of FPC. So the 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 pistol brace is currently legal, um, which with the, there is a nationwide injunction right now. So, right. but yeah, um, uh, did have one jam with lighter ammo, and we'll, uh, that'll be in the video. Um, but, uh, and then I also have, and this is on loan. I have to send it back. This is the CMMG Banshee, the Banshee right here. Yeah. yeah. And this is, this will feed anything, but hard cast ammo, unless it's really, really hard, like a brindle hardest of 21 or 22. If it's your regular Buffalo bore or, um, uh, Underwood stuff, it's like a 16 or 17. It throws it all over the place. Like the hard oh, cast really? okay. messes up the group. Like I had a 15 inch group at a, at a at 50 yards. With wow. That, with that. And this is normally a three to five inch grouper in most stuff, but the the extreme defenders that jammed in the in the uh, strybog, they'll get a one inch group. So this one this one in particular likes the lighter weight ammo. And they're both so, ten mil, right? They're both ten mil. I was hoping I would buy it from them and SBR it, and it'd be a a good you know accompaniment to the uh, um, Glock, you know, with the same magazines. I was hoping it'd be a really good accompaniment uh, for my wife, but yeah. That's, that is what it is. So mm, interesting. Yeah. Well, all so right. Let's, well, let's let's go ahead and wrap it up now because we are going on quite a bit of late time. It's nine o'clock here in Colorado, and I got to help get the kids to bed. So, I'm, dude, yeah. I've really enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did, and I'd like oh, to yeah. have you back on and be able to come on your show as well. So, you know, absolutely, yeah. So, yeah, but it, if people want to find me, it's Alaskan Ballistics. I have a live chat every Tuesday night. I call Tuesday night Gun Chat, and then I have. Um, uh, I usually have one long form video and about three shorts coming out every week. Um, so hopefully that'll uh, uh, get people to find me. I'm at the real Alaskan ballistics on Instagram since somebody hacked my original account and uh, AK ballistics on Twitter X. So I'll need you to send me over your socials and then I'll post it into the video when I post okay. it online. Cause I post it to rumble. The podcasts actually do really well on rumble for some reason. Mm-hmm. But if oh, I can cool. get your socials, I'll post it both on Rumble and also on YouTube. And I post it to yep. Spotify, but I'm not going to post your socials on Spotify. People don't go there right. to look up socials. So, cool. but I'll, anyways, uh, let's uh, let's wrap it up, but let's stay on. Leave the app open. I'm going to end the recording. I'm going to cut okay. this out, but we'll wrap it up here in a second. And then uh, I'll edit this part up, but don't turn the app off because you're at 77% uploaded and I still need that other 23%. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, I see that. Mm-hmm. All right, let me wrap it up. Then. All right, everybody. Whoa, what an awesome guest. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. It was awesome to have you on. Awesome to share hear, hear you share your knowledge about not just the bush life up in Alaska, but your extensive knowledge with firearms, ballistics, you know, armor, your thoughts on politics. I mean, this was a great, great episode, and I really want to have you back on here. Um, so, yeah, thank you, brother. Thank you. Anytime, brother. All right.